Hello, do we have the right time for the We're starting in a moment. We're waiting for some of our uh, colleagues to come in. So. The uh, Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will now come to order. Today, the subcommittee is holding a hearing entitled Trusting the Tap, Upgrading America's Drinking Water Infrastructure. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, members can participate in today's hearing either in person or remotely via online video conferencing. In accordance with the updated guidance issued by the attending physician, members, staff, and members of the press present in the hearing room are not required to wear a mask. For members participating remotely, your microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members participating remotely will need to unmute your microphone each time you wish to speak. Please note that once you unmute your microphone, anything that is uh, said in WebEx will be heard over the loudspeakers in the committee room and subject to be heard by the live stream and C-SPAN. Since members are participating from different locations at today's hearing, all recognition of members, such as for questions, will be the, in the order of subcommittee seniority. Documents for the record can be sent to Rebecca Tomalchik at the email address we've provided to staff, and all documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of this hearing. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. For many years, under both Democratic and Republican majorities, this committee has heard from a chorus of state and local governments, 
public health and environmental organizations, labor unions, and American manufacturers urging Congress to provide greater federal assistance in support of our nation's crumbling water infrastructure. We are all too aware of water systems struggles, frequent main breaks, massive leaks of treated water, PFAS contaminations, and an estimated 10 million lead pipes in service which are overwhelmingly found in low-income communities and communities of color. These challenges, on top of a growing backlog of maintenance projects, put financial stress on local governments and water authorities, which then translates to rate increases for water users. I believe that every federally elected official should bear some responsibility and, frankly, some shame that there are so many Americans that lack access to safe, reliable, and, yes, affordable drinking water. Only since last year can we say that we have made an honest attempt to tackle the scale of this problem. Last year's bipartisan infrastructure law made an historic down payment to address our long neglected water infrastructure. It included more than $50 billion for water systems, and today we will have an opportunity to examine the funding being distributed through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. This includes some $11.7 billion to supplement the drinking water SRF's annual appropriations, $15 billion for the replacement of lead service lines, and $4 billion to address emerging contaminants in drinking water, such as PFAS. Furthermore, Congress has required that 49% of the funds for the SRF supplemental and lead lines be provided as grants and forgivable loans to our disadvantaged communities. Given this historic investment, there will certainly need to be some adjustments made by states. And with that in mind, earlier this month, EPA issued an implementation memo to provide information to states on how best to administer these new funds. And by providing this funding through the SRF, states have flexibility to meet their unique needs. This is the nature of the cooperative federalism enshrined in the Safe Drinking Water Act, and I have no doubt that it can continue to be a successful model. It is my expectation that EPA will continue to provide technical assistance and guidance on how states can make the most of these funds, including by identifying best practices to enhance capacity building and program access for rural and disadvantaged uh, communities. We know that ramping up state and local government's capacity to administer these funds effectively will have its challenges. But we should not allow these challenges, which can and will be overcome, by committed states to overshadow the immense opportunity being provided by this funding. States and local governments will finally be able to address their immense infrastructure backlogs. They will have a pipeline of resources to enable recruitment and training of the next generation of water sector employees and the ability to access SRF funds as grants and forgivable loans provides new opportunities to small and disadvantaged systems that previously would never have been able to consider an SRF loan. It is no surprise that stakeholders, such as the National Rural Water Association and the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, have submitted letters, which will be entered into the hearing uh, record later today, that celebrate this funding's potential benefits to rural communities. The bipartisan infrastructure law will result in long overdue work getting done. It will fund projects that will make America Americans healthier, and it will create jobs. The city of Newark has proven it can be done, and the work being done in Milwaukee is further confirming that there are replicable models for removing lead lines and repairing infrastructure that results in developing a localized, unionized workforce. This funding will not solve all of our nation's water issues. There is still work to do, both to ensure effective implementation of these funds as well as efforts to improve water affordability system resilience, and certainly standard setting. But I am excited that today we will hear from state, local, public health, and labor organizations to understand the opportunities created by this bipartisan infrastructure law. I do thank our witnesses for joining us this morning, and I look forward to your testimonies. And with that, I will now recognize the uh, ranking uh, member of the uh, subcommittee, uh, Representative McKinley from West Virginia. Uh, Mike is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, they publish a report card uh, that ranks the states according to their water quality and uh, their whole infrastructure system. And they, they commented that Nevada and Oregon were ranked first and second for their quality of their infrastructure. 
So it, it may be understandable that those states may have had a reservation, representatives may have had some re reservations about funding an infrastructure bill. But what about Mississippi, West Virginia, who ranked last? If you look at their report card, we're ranked last in the country. Their, our drinking water alone in West Virginia was, was given a D, the lowest rating. These states are desperate. Nearly everyone in Congress says America needs better infrastructure. But when they were given a chance to vote for the bill last year, it didn't pass unanimously. So, Mr. Chairman, look, I, I've been a member of Congress for the nearly 12 years, and this was the first opportunity we had to get a real infrastructure bill to the president's desk. Oh, President Obama talked about doing it, but in the eight years, he never did it. And then President Trump wanted to pass an infrastructure bill, but Speaker Pelosi wouldn't let his bill come to the floor. So, and after months of bickering here, partisan bickering, I appreciate the leadership's decision to keep the social spending known as Build Back Better separate from the bill. It's now, this bill we had passed last year is pure infrastructure. And according to Forbes, the social spending portion is dead in the Senate. So when I'm back in West Virginia, I hear great things from stakeholders everywhere I go about this bill, from Marie Prezioso with the West Virginia Water Development Authority and Todd Grinstead with the West Virginia Rural Water Company Association. They talk about communities like Aurora, Fairview, Paw Paw, and McDowell and Wayne County, uh, McDowell and, and, and Wyoming counties. These communities are struggling, Mr. Chairman. According to the West Virginia DEP, our state has nearly 2,500 miles of contaminated water streams. So this bipartisan infrastructure bill is, is a once in a lifetime opportunity for these small and rural communities to get clean, affordable water. But this committee is gonna to need to conduct rigorous oversight. Democrats, unfortunately, have a history of prioritizing climate change over drinking water and putting urban interests over those of rural communities. For example, President Obama cut funding for the state revolving fund for rural areas by half. So these communities must be vigilant to ensure uh, this, this committee particularly, and, and, and to you, Mr. And Mr. Chairman, we've gotta be vigilant that the small and rural communities are not left out again. So I look forward to today's discussion and I yield back the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Pallone, the hardworking chair of the full committee for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Tonko, particularly for that hardworking <laughs> remark. Thank you. It's true. Today, today, the committee is continuing its ongoing work to ensure all Americans have access to safe and clean drinking water. And when you think about it, there's no more basic necessity in our lives than drinking water. All, we all need to be able to trust that when we turn the tap on our faucets, the water coming out is safe for us and for our families. Unfortunately, for far too long, we failed to properly invest in our aging drinking water infrastructure. And as Chairman Tonko mentioned, the American Society of Civil Engineers just last year gave our nation's water infrastructure a C minus grade. And that's simply unacceptable for a nation as prosperous as ours. Fortunately, last November, this Congress acted by passing the bipartisan infrastructure law, which included $30 billion to strengthen and rebuild our drinking water infrastructure. And this is the single largest federal investment in our drinking water infrastructure in our nation's history. Specifically, the law provides over $11 billion to bolster the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, our main funding mechanism for drinking water projects. And the Drinking Water SRF provides flexibility to states to address pressing drinking water challenges. It's imperative that we leverage this flexibility to ensure that we're lifting up communities. And while the SRF has been a critical lifeline, there are many small, rural, and underserved communities that face barriers to access this federal funding source, or ranking member mentioned that, and those communities which often have the greatest needs will benefit from additional resources and assistance, and we should ensure that they can tap into them. Now, the bipartisan infrastructure law also includes $15 billion to help accelerate the inventory and removal of lead service lines, which is one of my priorities as chairman. Earlier this year, I was pleased to see NORC, and we have Director Adim here representing NORC in my home state 
uh, they completed their efforts to replace all of the lead service lines. But millions of other Americans in other places are being exposed to lead and drinking water through lead service lines. And this is extremely troubling considering that there is no safe lead exposure level. All these lead pipes must be replaced. And this funding will provide a huge boost in our efforts to finally address the long-standing issue of lead and drinking water. The law also allocates $9 billion to remove dangerous PFAS chemicals, also known as forever chemicals, from drinking water. And this funding will help water systems clean up PFAS contamination that's becoming more prevalent and is linked to adverse health effects. This investment will accelerate current infrastructure projects and kickstart new, often costly projects. So with the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're, we're not only modernizing our infrastructure in a more resilient way for the future, but we're also strengthening our local economies. With provisions to expand the use of American iron and steel and prevailing wage protections, the bipartisan infrastructure law will help create good paying jobs across industries and bolster domestic manufacturing. But as I said, clean, safe, and safe drinking water is, in my opinion, a fundamental right. And the bipartisan infrastructure law provides our nation with the necessary resources to take a long overdue step towards making safe drinking water a reality for all, including disadvantaged communities that have been disproportionately impacted by environmental contamination. I just wanted to take a minute to say that I appreciate all our witnesses today, but especially Nork's Water and Sewer Utilities Director, Karim Adim. Thanks to his leadership, along with the mayor, Mayor Baraka, and Governor Murphy and our congressional delegation, Nork successfully completed the replacement of all of its lead lines earlier this year. And I really want to commend you for your work, Director Adim. He, mayor Baraka um, made this a major point um, that he wanted to do this. Um, and, um, you know, Congress helped in other ways. We actually had to redirect some of the funds from the Clean Water Act with legislation that, that I had introduced in the, uh, in the House and Senator Booker championed uh, in the Senate, uh, and Donald Payne also. I should I have to mention Congressman Payne, who represents New York. Um, but I still think it was amazing that you did this so quickly, that you were able to do it so quickly. It really was amazing. So thank you again, and thank you for being here. We have an incredible opportunity to build resilience and invest in the future of communities. We also have an opportunity to continue to work on bipartisan basis to ensure these funds have a long lasting impact, which is why Chairman Tonka is having this hearing today. And while this funding is a critical step in closing the resource gap for drinking water, there's a lot more we can do and should do to ensure that every person can trust the water that's coming out of the tap. So thank you again. Uh, Chairman Tonko, this is a very important hearing. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now, uh, the chair will recognize represent, Representative Buddy Carter of Georgia, who is speaking on behalf of Mrs. Rogers, the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, Mr. Carter, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of our witnesses for being here. We appreciate your attendance very much. From day one, I urged for there to be transparency on the massive amounts of money this Congress has been providing to the executive branch. Record government spending is fueling inflation, and it is out of control. From the gas pump to the grocery store, it's making it harder for people to pay for basic expenses to get by. We just learned that funds from the Democrats' quote, American Rescue Plan, have been spent on things like a hotel, a ballpark, and ski slopes. This is the kind of waste we warned about when Democrats acted alone to spend $2 trillion. Where's the accountability we've been asking for? Whether it's over this $2 trillion in inflationary spending or over the Senate infrastructure law, there must be proper oversight over how we spend people's hard-earned taxpayers' dollars. American families who are struggling to afford gas, cars, food, new clothes, and heating their homes, they deserve the certainty that their duly elected representatives are leading to ensure funds aren't wasted or abused. We should all be asking if the federal government wants to spend more money. Can the American people afford it? Today is an important opportunity for this subcommittee to review and conduct oversight over the Safe Drinking Water Act provisions in the Senate infrastructure law, and I appreciate the chairman scheduling it. That being said, we're missing an important witness, the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA is responsible for implementing the law we are discussing today. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that you will work with us to invite EPA to testify about its implementation of the $35 billion in funding for safe drinking water programs. So let me be clear. 
My stated concerns with the drinking water provisions in the Senate infrastructure law are about transparency and accountability. Without question, I want our communities to have safe drinking water. I was a mayor at one time. I get it. I understand how important it is. Making that water safe, though, costs money. Some communities, because it requires a monetary investment, again, I get it and I understand. I was mayor of a growing city. Because it requires a monetary investment, they need help from the federal government. But simply throwing money at drinking water challenges using a federal one-size-fits-all approach is no way to solve the problems many communities face. My concerns start with the large amounts of spending, but also include whether EPA is using this bill as an excuse to overtake drinking water program management, spending flexibility, and utility operations. These are all areas that traditionally fail, or excuse me, that traditionally fall to local governments and to the states. A federal takeover would be unprecedented and troubling. My concerns with the safe drinking water provisions in the Senate infrastructure bill go further. First, what are the impacts of the law's mandates on required spending? Promoting purchasing power for communities should be our highest aim. If we swallow up this goal with requirements that strain the ability to complete necessary projects, we do both taxpayers and those serving communities a disservice. Second, how will this additional new funding and EPA's guidance affect existing state drinking water revolving funds? And will any of the changes relate only to the Senate infrastructure funding, or will they have long-term impacts to project prioritization on the state revolving fund? Third, will this law improve cybersecurity at drinking water plants, or does it just increase the burdens on utilities and strain their resources? Fourth, there are questions about the lead service line replacement provisions. For example, do EPA and the states know where the lead service lines are, and will the agency ensure that millionaires do not benefit under this program? Finally, there are concerns about rural communities' role in the funding. Will rural communities have access to funding and technical assistance, or could they fall just outside of the definition of disadvantaged communities? The Senate infrastructure law has both substantial authorizing and appropriations provisions, so we have a lot to cover today. Again, I hope in a future hearing, the EPA is here to formally answer questions about its use of $35 billion in additional funding. This is important to ensure accountability and understand any changes that may be needed in the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to our conversation today, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair reminds members that Pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. I now introduce the witnesses for today's hearing. We have Mr. Eric Olson, Senior Strategic Director for Health and Food, Natural Resources Defense Council. We have Ms. Lori Mathau, uh, Public Health Branch Chief of the Environmental Health and Drinking Water Branch of Connecticut's Department of Public Health and President of the Association of Drinking Water Administrators. Mr. Kareem Adim, Director of Water and Sewer Utilities for the City of Newark, Newark, New Jersey. And on Zoom, we have Mr. Richard Diaz, Midwest Regional Field Organizer for the Blue Green Alliance. And then finally, Mr. Jim McGough, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Environmental Programs, Indiana Finance Authority, on behalf of the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities. We welcome each and every one of you here today and on Zoom, and at this time, the chair will recognize each witness for five minutes to provide the opening statement. Before we begin, I would like to explain the lighting system. In front of our witnesses is a series of lights. The light will initially be green. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. Since we have witnesses appearing virtually, I need to ask my colleagues in the hearing room to mute themselves whenever they are not directly speaking during their Q&A portion so that we can indeed clearly hear the witnesses' responses. So with that, we now recognize Mr. Olson for five minutes, please, to provide your opening statement. And again, welcome. Thank you, welcome. Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, Ranking Member McKinley and all members of the committee. Um, I am Eric Olson with NRDC Natural Resources Defense Council, and I wanted to emphasize that this bipartisan infrastructure law, I'll call it the bill, um, really makes historic investments. And 
I appreciate the bipartisan nature of the investments that are being made and appreciate the ranking member's vote in favor of this as well as uh, many other members of this committee. It's a historic investment that is going to yield benefits for a long time. One issue that we've talked about, heard about a little bit already is the $15 billion that's going to be invested to remove these lead pipes, which is basically like drinking water out of a lead straw. We don't want to be doing that. And the good news is that that investment is going to take a big bite out of this problem. But $15 billion, it's about a third of what we need. The uh, reconciliation bill that this body passed um, some time ago would add an additional $10 billion that is really urgently needed money in addition. Um, and I wanted to point out that this historic investment really is something that's broadly supported. All the polling shows that about 90% of the public supports investing in things like pulling out all these lead pipes. So this is something that's both good sense um, from a public uh, support standpoint, but also, of course, from a public health standpoint. One thing that we really need to do is ensure, as several members have already mentioned, is make sure that this money is being targeted well to the disadvantaged communities that need it. And I'll emphasize that the states get the vast majority of this money. This is not going to be administered by the federal government in most cases. Most of that money is going out to each individual state. The state defines what a disadvantaged community is and the state is going to be allocating the money. So we need to make sure that that money is being targeted where it's needed most, be it a rural community that has urgent need, or be it a, a large city that may have a pocket of uh, low-income people that really need to get that help. The bill also um, includes, as has been mentioned by a couple of members, $9 billion to address these um, so-called PFAS, the um, chemicals that have been around for now many years and are just starting to show up. West Virginia, New York, many other states. North Carolina has a severe problem with PFAS contamination. Basically, every state has this. We believe that it's going to be a top priority to make sure that's addressed. In addition, there are a lot of good jobs that are going to be created. You're going to hear from Mr. Adim in uh, Newark, who has created a lot of jobs of local people um, who are trained by a local union. Um, these jobs are very um, well-paying. We hope that they're going to be permanent. Um, I cite in my testimony a study that found over 560,000 job years that are going to be created just by pulling out the lead pipes. Those are going to be good-paying jobs under this infrastructure legislation. It's crucial that that go forward. But I'll point out that industry estimates are that the total cost is going to be a trillion dollars for all of our water and drinking water infrastructure fixes. That's a big investment. We're going to need more than has already um, been put on the table. We've got a historic investment, but there's a lot more needed. Nine to 12 million lead service lines still in the ground, lead in schools, um, which this legislation didn't quite tackle. Um, there are widespread PFAS contamination problems, and 30 million people are served by systems that are in violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act. All that needs to be addressed. In addition, we've got some pockets in Apple. Five minutes, please, and uh, the mic is yours. Good morning, Subcommittee Chairman Tonko, a Ranking Member McKinley, uh, members of the subcommittee. My name is Lori Matthew, and I'm the president of the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, known as ASWA. We have 57 members, and we include all 50 states and five territorial programs, the Navajo Nation and the District of Columbia. Thank you for this incredible opportunity to appear before you in the subcommittee to discuss effective and efficient implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law for safe drinking water. A collaborative partnership is always and has always been needed since the beginning of time with the Safe Drinking Water Act between all of us, states, tribes, territories, and federal government. First of all, first and foremost, we collectively and sincerely wish to say thank you for this funding. This is a substantial increase in funding under the bill and investment in safe drinking water and public health. ASMA members have compliance oversight and enforcement authority or primacy of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Our members and their staff are the scientists and the engineers on the front lines every day implementing the act and executing the laws that you pass. We provide technical assistance and oversight of drinking water systems. That is our job every single day. I am also as you mentioned, the Public Health Branch Chief at the Environmental Health and Drinking Water Branch of the Connecticut Department of Public Health. I've been a public health official for over 34 years. I oversee statewide programs that address primacy of the Safe Drinking Water Act and regulation of drinking water systems. 
uh, the, also the SRF program. We also have a PFAS and Emerging Contaminants program, certified operator program. We've started a new climate change and public health program. We also oversee a number of lead um, uh, programs that uh, work to um, prevent lead exposure. Today, I will discuss ASBA's perspective on implementation of the bill. My testimony has three basic themes. We want to focus on getting the lead out everywhere. ASBA supports the removal of all lead service lines across the country, from the water main to where the lead service line goes to the building wall. The development of the inventories is only the first step. Then we need to move toward a removal. ASBA requests that Congress consider providing for additional subsidization up to possibly 100% loan forgiveness for lead service line replacements. In Connecticut, Governor Lamont has proposed Bill 5045, which focuses on lead, uh, childhood lead poisoning, and we are working to merge all efforts to reduce lead exposure. Flexibility and ease in bill implementation is critical to achieving the goal of equity and helping systems and communities that need the funding the most. As stated in EPA's recent implementation bill memo from Radica Fox, states are responsible for defining disadvantaged communities, taking into account local conditions. In Connecticut and in many states, we are currently working with our leadership to right now enhance our focus on communities that need the funding the most with a focus on health equity. Streamline the SRF programs, the application process. States and EPA need to work together to make applying for the bill funds um, and the SRF programs as simple and as easy as possible while ensuring the requirements are addressed. Let's work together to develop waivers. ASBA recommends the development of waivers in limited circumstances for the requirements of Buy America, Build America, and the Davis-Bacon Acts to make funds simpler to obtain for those most in need. Sustainability, durability, and longevity. Public water systems that receive bill funding need to be durable, resilient, and have longevity. While the bill funding is substantial, we need the public water systems that use these funds to be able to appropriately operate and maintain their infrastructure. Being resilient into the future is important. There are over 124,000 small community public water systems in this country. Many lack long-term du durability and, and to meet the challenges, the, the many challenges of the Safe Drinking Water Act. In Connecticut, we have 400 of those small systems in rural settings, many in disadvantaged communities. The DWSRF program, states and EPA need to work together to ensure that the SRF loans are sustainable and have longevity with the split of loans versus principal forgiveness. The bill funding is only the first step to address the needs of our drinking water infrastructure. Workforce, the workforce needs sustainable workforce and the bill funds through these bill funds and beyond with a particular focus on engineers. It is incredibly hard to find engineers to take our jobs these days. Um, cybersecurity, we must never forget this issue and we must recognize and address it. Um, and it's a growing threat and we want to work closely with EPA and our colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security. As we participate today in this hearing, as members are hard working on the implementation right now, and we're moving forward in Connecticut right now, we have an open call for projects. This unprecedented funding will improve the country's infrastructure and public health. We look forward to keeping Congress informed of our progress. And again, thank you so much for this investment in safe drinking water and public health. It is greatly appreciated by our membership across the country and certainly within the great state of Connecticut, Department of Public Health, who I represent. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you, Ms. Mathau. And next we move to Mr. Adeem. Let me congratulate you and Newark on the efforts you've made and the achievement. So uh, you're recognized, sir, for five minutes, please. Thank you, um, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member McKinley, and um, subcommittee members, and Congressman Pallone, New Jersey's own. Um, good morning. It's an honor to be here in front of the Congressional Subcommittee on Environmental and Climate. And I especially like to, I especially like to just, you know, thank uh, my Congre the Congress, um, Congressional Congress for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. This bill, the city of Newark has seen firsthand how investment in, in infrastructure can impact community. 
This investment is not just in our water and wastewater infrastructure. This bill is going to provide human capital infrastructure. You know, from employing local residents to come and work on uh, union scale jobs to remove lead service lines, to install water mains, but also having mom and pop businesses take a part of what's going on in their community. Moreover, the bipartisan infrastructure bill is the most significant investment in the nation that in my lifetime. This bill is a central step in the right direction to provide safe drinking water to everyone in America. In addition, the federal government will invest infrastructure upgrades and provide economic capital to communities like others in New Jersey. I have witnessed these investment benefits and water infrastructure improvements firsthand. And we'd like to just share a couple of them with the committee. I'd like to talk about our lead service line replacement program. Was the investment in human capital and the solution to a long ne neglected problem. Of the 200 million spent on repairs and replacements of lead service line, 70% of that money stayed in the local community, the city of Newark. And it stayed in the community when we hired local contractors, subcontractors, and emphasized that they hire sit Newark residents from the union apprenticeship program that we've created. And we created a, new, a unique program with assistance from the city's Department of Workforce Development, our state Department of Labor, and the local union 472. Collaboration made the success of this program appreciated. The apprenticeship program trained and taught dozens of our residents the skills that the skills that they need for the future to earn middle-class salaries and get permanent jobs, permanent union jobs. As more cities replace lead service lines and start water infrastructure with federal infrastructure money, our residents will find continued employment. In addition, we help women and minority-owned business find opportunities for these projects, support in everything from engineering inspections to printing door hangers to informing our residents in community meetings. One of our the tremendous success is the joy of community being a part of an economic investment. They actually see it. A lot, a, lot, a lot of times when we look at government doing a project, we look at our highway system, no disrespect to the highway system, we always see that construction lasts for decades. We can ride down the New Jersey Turnpike, we can ride down I-95, and we always see construction going on. However, no one takes a look at water and wastewater needs because it's a buried asset. This buried asset is only brought upon light when it's a crisis or when we have a major flooding event or a water main break where there's a lack of water. And everyone wants to know then that we need to hurry up and fix our aging infrastructure. As, my, as the fellow Congress members today pointed out that the American Society of Engineers give us a C average. We're in the greatest country in the world. We should have an A. We should have an A for infrastructure. You know, um, investments in water, um, is an investment in human capital because we're protecting valuable lives with drinking water. <laughs> so I leave here today, I just want to say, in, you know, one, engage with your state. A part of making these programs efficient and effective would be engaging with your state revival loan for, program early. Have meetings and conversations with them to understand the process limits of funding, the terms, and construction, long-term finances. Lead service line are not are the homeowner's property. We had to make sure we had special legislation in place to remove lead service lines by right? spending public money on private property. Schedule meetings with your local, county, and state officials. The infrastructure money is to be used to replace infrastructure, not to be held up by bureaucratic red tape and permitting process. In Newark, most disadvantaged people rent in other, city, in other major cities too. 74% of our residents in the city of Newark are renters. We need a council ordinance to pass to make sure we had the right, act, the right of access to go on private property and replace lead service lines. We understand that collaboration on the federal, state, and local level will move projects forward, but we under, understand that there are emerging contaminants that also need to be addressed, and this infrastructure funding bill will provide the needed necessities to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adim. And now we'll move to our uh, next uh, witness who is joining us virtually, Mr. Diaz. You're recognized, please, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Tonko, Ranking Member McKinley, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Richard Diaz, and I'm the Midwest Regional Field Organizer with the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, we are a national partnership of labor unions and environmental organizations. 
Thank you for convening this hearing on upgrading America's drinking water infrastructure. As it was stated earlier, uh, our nation's drinking water infrastructure received a grade of a C minus by the American Society of Civil Engineers. The good news is that the $55 billion investment in water infrastructure within the bipartisan infrastructure law is the largest federal investment we have ever seen in our water systems. And it is a significant down payment on the $434 billion investment gap identified in the ASCE's 2021 infrastructure report card. 15 of that $55 billion investment will be to fund the replacement of lead service lines. There is no safe level of lead exposure. Communities of color and low income communities often bear the brunt of the hazards of lead water contamination. Eliminating lead exposure in our water systems can not only keep communities healthy, but also create good paying jobs and boost local economies across the country, particularly if impacted communities are hired to do this work. An analysis by the Blue Green Alliance found that the $15 billion investment for lead service line replacement would result in the creation of about 200,000 jobs over 10 years. Those same investments made by the bill will greatly benefit the construction industry. For example, plumbing, pipe fitting, and steam fitting all have an industry that currently employs about 300,000 workers and is expected to see a job growth of around 16% through 2026. And this investment will be a massive job creator for American manufacturing, thanks to strong domestic procurement and prevailing wage provisions. According to the Alliance for American Manufacturing, Buy America provisions lead to a 33% increase in manufacturing jobs per dollar of public spending. At McWayne Ductile Pipe in Ohio, members of the United Steelworkers Local 7014 produce ductile iron pipe used in water infrastructure. Buy America helps keep this facility open and provides the foundation for more good union jobs in the decades to come. We also have to make sure that these are not just good jobs, but accessible jobs. This means supporting and growing pathways into good union water sector jobs for women and workers of color historically underrepresented. Provisions needed to ensure these jobs are good and accessible include registered apprenticeships, free apprenticeship programs, and other union affiliated training programs, as well as project labor agreements, community workforce agreements, and community benefits agreements. The bill also includes a number of changes that will help direct funding to communities that need it most, a requirement that 49% at least of that funding be distributed as grants or forgivable loans. This will be helpful to people like Ms. Ladora Meadows from my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She is someone who has been in the same house for over four decades in a neighborhood where the median income level is well below the poverty line. And she is someone who has taken care of many children in the neighborhood. Some of those lead poison children. And she's decided to get her lead service line replaced. Trying to protect her family from lead exposure, Miss Ladora ended up with a bill of more than $1,000. And that's $1,000 she doesn't have. Resources and bill will help families like Ms. Ladora's, but it will be crucial for the EPA to provide technical assistance for communities applying for funds to ensure that disadvantaged communities benefit equitably from these investments. The bill funding will help rebuild our nation's water infrastructure and will help protect Americans from the irreversible damage of lead poisoning. We will save billions of dollars that would have been spent on medical treatments, special education, crime, and juvenile delinquency caring for lead poison individuals. We also save billions of dollars in treated water that is lost from water main breaks and leaks. This translates into benefits for the environment and for all rural, urban, and suburban communities. And we do it while creating high quality union jobs, not only at construction job sites, but manufacturing facilities down the supply chain. The bill's investment and continued investment in our water infrastructure is a win for our country. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today.
You're most welcome, Mr. Diaz, and thank you for your participation. And finally, we turn to Mr. McCough, who is recognized now for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair Tonka, Ranking Member McKinley, Chair Pallone, Ranking Member McRogers, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jim McGough, and I'm the Director of Environmental Programs for the Indiana Finance Authority. I'm testifying uh, today on behalf of the Council of Infrastructure Financing Authorities, which represents the Clean Water and Drinking Water Revolving Funds. I would like to begin my testimony by taking this opportunity to personally thank you and the other members of Congress for trusting and empowering the state drinking water SRF programs with the financial resources to make meaningful investments in our nation's drinking water infrastructure. I know the success of our programs is well documented and included in my written testimony, so I'll get right to the purpose of this hearing. I visit today with a simple request. Please consider expanding our ability to quickly and effectively deploy, to deploy the historic funding in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. My comments will focus on the SRF's ability to utilize the funding for emerging contaminants and lead service line replacement in a way that achieves our shared goal of protecting the health of the American people. I can confidently say the SRF programs are experts in providing low-cost financial assistance for every community's drinking water need. Congress is right to choose the SRF programs when looking for the appropriate vehicle to address emerging contaminants and lead service line removal. However, to be able to achieve the intent of the law, this targeted funding requires more flexible and innovative approach than the base program that we currently monitor. For example, firefighting foam. It is currently stored at every firefighting station and usually contains PFAS or PFOA. We believe the intent of the legislation included the ability of states to inventory, collect, and properly dispose of these toxic chemicals. My apologies, but being from Indiana, I feel compelled to make at least one basketball analogy here. This is a layup. Of course, we should be able to use this funding to eliminate that public health threat. However, because we would not be providing financial assistance directly to a drinking water utility, we have been informed that we are not permitted to use the emerging contaminant funding you have provided to, our, to address this critical problem. Another example, PFAS and PFOA and other contaminants that would qualify as emerging can be found in our soils and other areas not associated with a drinking water utility. Again, the SRF programs cannot go into these urban neighborhoods, desperately needing the financial assistance to address known and identified emerging contaminants with this funding unless they are somehow associated with a drinking water utility. EPA has provided flexibility in the past, primarily within the Clean Water SRF program. And however, we would hope with your urging and or modifications to the bill, EPA would do the same with the Drinking Water SRF program. For example, an SRF program has used its Clean Water SRF funds to fund energy efficiency projects with EPA approval under the theory that energy efficient addition to homes would reduce energy use, which would reduce energy production, which would reduce stack emissions, which would reduce particulate matter leaving the stack and falling into a receiving stream. Arguably, there is a greater threat of a container of firefighting foam failing and leaking in the basement of a firehouse, or the more likely scenario of it being used and then flowing into a receiving, a receiving stream or well, and that may be the, only, the town's only source of drinking water. I will now turn our, my attention to our ability to address lead service line. Federal law requires that we provide EPA with a list of projects we intend to fund before we can draw down the first dollar. So the funds you have made available to the states cannot be used unless and until we provide EPA with a list of projects that will be funded. Therein lies the problem. Utilities in many states have not begun the process of developing an inventory of lead service lines. It would be logical to think we would be able to use these funds to generate a statewide inventory and then begin the process of removing the lead lines. However, we are limited to only using a fraction of the funds for this purpose, funds referred to as set-asides are generally reserved for program administrative expenses or state-specific initiatives may be eligible, but in the aggregate would not be sufficient to adequately um, address the necessary inventories. 
Logic suggests, and we believe your intent, would be that the lead service line funding be eligible for use in all things associated with the removal, or at the very least, the first and second year of funding be eligible for inventories, believing that once inventoried, uh, the later year's funding could be uh, targeted for their removal. We do not believe wholesale changes to the legislation are necessary. It's good legislation. But minor revisions are needed to ensure we can achieve its goals. Thank you. Mr. McGough, thank you. And thank you to all of our witnesses again for your participation here today. That concludes your opening statements, and we now will move to member questions. And I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Now, we often hear about water systems needs in big numbers. $472 billion often quoted as that needed for the next 20 years. Uh, Mr. Olson, can you um, please help us uh, contextualize these needs? What does it mean today for American families, for their health, and for their pocketbooks, that water systems require nearly half a trillion in investment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will say that that's even a low ball estimate according to the American Water Works Association, which estimates it could be a trillion dollars. Um, I think what it means is there's so many communities around the country, as we've heard, this is a buried asset. Most people don't know that they have problems with their drinking water until <laughs> they don't have water if there's a water main break, or they learn that they have lead contamination in their water, um, or if they're in a rural community that they have serious mm. contamination problems. Um, so what it means to communities across the country is if we don't invest in these problems, it's, I said in my testimony, it's a lot like an old, decades old car that hasn't had a brake job or oil change in years. Um, that's sort of what we're operating with in a lot of communities across the country, is these water systems are starting to fall apart. They are not modernized. They're delivering, in many cases, water that's not up to snuff. It's especially true in lower income communities and in many rural communities that have real problems. So what it means to Americans is um, many of us are getting water that's not safe, Many of us are getting water that should be better, even if it meets standards. And these kinds of investments from the bipartisan deal will take us a long way towards helping to fix the problem. Thank you. And Ms. Matthew, I looked up Connecticut's latest SRF intended use plan. For a relatively small state, there were a lot of proposed projects. Can you discuss how far this new funding could go to addressing the state's infrastructure backlog? Excellent question, and thank you for looking up our intended use plan. <laughs> very much appreciate it. We're very proud of our SRF program. So in our little state, we have 2,400 public water systems. 2,400 in the little state of Connecticut. 2,000 of those are non-communities. There are about 725 that are formally eligible to apply for the SRFs. Um, how fun, well, there's a lot of, we haven't used one word here, but which is really important, aging infrastructure. It is prevalent. Our treatment systems, as, as Mr. Olson mentioned, a lot of our treatment plants need between 40 to $60 million in replacement funding. Many of our, even our more larger municipal systems cannot afford that on their own. They need the subsidization. They need, we have allowed, we've actually rebuilt a treatment plant in, the, in Groton, at Groton. Uh, which serves about 80,000 people. They couldn't afford the $55 million uh, price. We were able to <clears throat> pull together some state funding to help them with the affordability of that loan. We have many small systems. In our state, um, we have 3.6 million people. We have 148 really small towns, very rural towns. Many small systems struggle. Many of you mentioned the small system problem. A small system to us in Connecticut is 25 people, literally 15 service connections. Affordability is a serious problem. Even taking on a loan, that's why one of the comments that we made, let's make the process as simple as possible. Taking on a loan is incredibly difficult, even if you gave them 80% subsidy, just to fill out the paperwork. So to make it simple and easy as possible, we, we like one of the ideas that has come out through EPA, and I think through the president himself, this idea of technical hubs. We want in, in our state of Connecticut, we've asked our EPA Boston people we, and headquarters staff, we would like a technical hub for Connecticut. We have enough systems and enough problems. We want a focused effort where our, us as regulators, we, we scare people when we show up. 
Like, let's face it, right? Every time we show up, it's thousands of dollars because we're pointing out violations. There's many violations that we, that we identify. So to bring in a technical expert under a technical hub idea um, that's funded directly by EPA to help, I, I would love to have that. Three to 400 systems to sit down and help apply for an SRF loan to help identify your lead service line inventories. Many of them don't even understand how to put that together. So to, to provide direct technical assistance to the communities that need it the most and these three to 400 really small systems would be really very important to be able to spend that money. Well, thank you very much. You. Um, okay, we now recognize Mr. McKinley, subcommittee ranking member for, for five minutes to question, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I tried to say in my opening remarks, I believe there's a nexus between states that have low per capita income and their ranking with their infrastructure. Particularly, the example would be Mississippi and West Virginia. So I, I wanna keep that in consideration as we go with this. Now let me go to, uh, Mr. Olson, you made a comment about lead water pipes and identifying. I, I, I really wanna give a shout out to Clarksburg Water Department, what they did, they, had, they found out they had a problem and they've been actively going after that and, and they've replaced most of those now and they are identifying the water lines, the lead pipes all throughout the, the, the district with that. So we're making the move on that. As Matthew, you made an interesting remark. You said you're finding a shortage of engineers uh, to do this. Uh, I, I would say to you, we got a shortage of engineers in Washington. Uh, I, I'm just one of two licensed engineers in, in Congress, and think about it. Here we're dealing with a massive right. infrastructure bill, and I'm, as we say, there are two licensed engineers, but there are 242 attorneys. So the question is, who do we want addressing our infrastructure? Uh, I'll, enough on that. We'll, we'll go back. But, but just, just last week, uh, I had a meeting uh, with a water, a water group, and they were telling me the lack of oversight, the concern they're having is the massive increase in water pipes and, and copper and fire hydrants and all. As a matter of fact, what they, they showed me was because of this lack of oversight and this control that we've now put in, a uh, eight inch PVC pipe, the, the kind of the heartbeat of, of water systems, uh, we're that's already increased our suppliers 210% over the last three years, 210%. Same thing with six inch, 157% increase. Fire hydrants, a 30 some percent increase in just two years. So I, I'm hoping that we can develop some kind of oversight with this, our chairman and our committees to be able to control this because our communities are not gonna be able to meet the infrastructure if we're faced with this kind of supply cost that, that's facing us. So let me go to the, uh, uh, some qu uh, two quick questions with it. Uh, Mr. McGough, uh, if I could with you, uh, states each have their own idea of what a disadvantaged community is and, and w whether it's urban or, or rural. And so that both of these communities, both rural and, and urban communities are on a level playing field. How can we ensure that the population and need are part of the, the uh, equal consideration as we go ahead? Need is huge for us in areas in West Virginia, Mississippi, and others that are struggling now to do this. How, how can we do that? How can we make sure that need is also included? Thank you for the question. And the, the SRF programs have been um, identifying and getting um, or targeting disadvantaged communities for years. Uh, so we are well equipped to each state. It has the ability and the flexibility to tailor uh, their definitions of a disadvantaged communities to fit their state need. Uh, for example, in Indiana, we have both urban and very rural uh, communities. Um, many of the rural communities are, are very much like what you've described in some of the uh, southern states. And so our disadvantaged um, community definition recognizes uh, very low median household income, high user rates, and we target our grant funding uh, that we have available, our forgivable loan funding that we have available, available to those communities. And the communities that can afford uh, a standard interest rate, uh, that's where we program those loans to. Thank you. Ms. Mathow, um, last year, but, and then prior to the infrastructure bill being passed, uh, the committee, this committee had uh, hearings on drinking water uh, Drinking, but primarily over leaking pipes and breaks. 
And, and according to the American Water Association, when they testified, they said that we're probably losing 30 to 40 percent of all the water treated because of leaks and breaks. So how will this how will this legislation start to address that so that we can be more efficient in our in our systems? Thank you for your question. It's, a, it's an important one. When you lose 30% of your product that you spend a lot of money producing, it, it, it's a shame. So aging infrastructure is a real problem. Water main replacement is, has always been a big part of the SRF programs, and I hope that it will continue. Um, our, our, some, of our, some of our water mains are, especially the water main that runs in, right on Capitol Avenue um, in the city of Hartford, is 100 years old. And what's interesting is they say, well, we got another 20 years on that pipe. It's good. So we have, a, in, our, in the northeastern part of the country, we have a lot of aging infrastructure. My colleague from New, New Jersey, uh, the pipes are old, systems are old. Um, we need the investment. And, and I know that one thing in Connecticut, our uh, intended use plan, our last call for projects, we had, 100, we had over 120 project requests totaling over $520 million in, in requests. We believe on this most recent call for projects, we will have over $800 million in requests for our little state of Connecticut. We also have 12 lead service line removal projects, totaling, asking for, over $134 million. A 1% state like we are in Connecticut for the SRFs, we're receiving in the bill $150 million over five years. Thank you, I've gone over my time. I that's, yield back. That's fine, engineers allow that, so. Um, the chair, uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Chairman Pallone of the full committee for five minutes to ask questions, please. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. I wanted to start with this, uh, Matthew. Um, we've talked a lot about the need to replace lead service lines, cleaning up PFAS, but all that can be very costly, right? So. Um, in, in a city like Newark, you know, the, the, uh, they struggled to get the funding, right? I mean, they did be, between the state and the federal government. So I, I just wanted to ask basically about resources, Ms. Matthew. Is sustained and robust federal investment like that provided by the BIF critical to helping water systems address these public health challenges? Or would we have just gotten the job done just as well using the incremental annual funding approach that we had until the bipartisan bill came along? That's a very good question. Thank you for that. This infusion of funding will significantly invest in our cities, uh, in their aging infrastructure across the country, as well as helping the smallest systems that need the help the most. In our most rural communities, they struggle just to pull water samples and to meet the timeframes of the Safe Drinking Water Act. This funding will help them and these technical assistance helps and our, our increased ability at the state level. We anticipate and are hopeful to hire additional engineers <laughs> to get the work done. We would love those professional engineers to take our jobs, but we have a hard time um, bringing engineers on for whatever reason um, there doesn't seem to be many coming to the table. But with this additional funding, it gives our state and other states across the country an incredible ability to change the way we have been investing uh, in public health and drinking water. Our aging infrastructure in our state alone, again, the needs are high, about $800 million, we believe, and we know that we can't afford that alone. So our, my colleague, you mentioned Mississippi. My, I know my colleague well, Bill Moody, um, in the state of Mississippi. And we just completed a, a nice week together during our member meeting. And he said, Lori, you know, when we, when we invest this money in these small systems and any system, we have to make sure those systems are resilient for the future. We see this as an investment in the future. And we, again, we really we cannot thank you enough for this investment in our, in our drinking water. As Mr. Dean said, these are not, I'm gonna say it, these are not the sexiest things, right? Because they're all buried, people don't know, people don't see the pipes in the ground, people don't know about the work that you all do uh, to, to supply drinking water every day, all day. They see the roads and the bridges. So to provide this level of money to safe drinking water and public health protection is tremendous. Um, and we, again, we, we are thrilled with it and want to get the work started. Well, thank you. Um, let me go to Mr. Adim. You, 
You, you talked, of course, about um, how um, there were a lot of jobs created and local jobs uh, as a result of this major effort to replace all the service lines in Newark. Just tell me a little more about the benefits to the community you've witnessed uh, as your city invested in this effort to replace the, the lead service lines. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Congressman Paul, Chairman Kamal. Um, as we seen that um, in our community, the city of Newark, we engage our local residents into coming into an apprenticeship program with the local trades union. Um, they had got an opportunity that they would never see. When we say never see, it's always hard to get into a union skilled job. The unions always have these announcements. We're hiring. You see them in the papers, and there's a long line where it could be as much as five to 10,000 people trying to get 20 positions. In the city of Newark, because we know we had an infrastructure project that was going to impact one local union, uh, the, the Labor's Union for Local 472, we met with them early and the State Department of Labor to make sure that we wanted to focus on putting Newark residents, right, those underprivileged residents that didn't have an opportunity, um, men and women, black and brown, that may have, that may have not had an opportunity to be a part of the union, to get into the union. Immediately, we seen the impact because not only when we were doing the lead service line replacement work in the community, um, residents that actually lived in the community had the opportunity to replace their own lead service line. So you're working on a job where you're replacing your own house. And the income that they received off those jobs, the middle class salary, they were putting that money back into the community. They lived in the community, they were investing back in the community. I was on a job site, me and uh, one of my colleagues and a former reporter went early in the morning and we had the street blocked off and we were helping a lady bring her groceries into a house because the street was blocked off. And she, her, she seen her nephew out there. She said, leave those gentlemen alone. They're working. Get away from them. And he says, auntie, I'm working. She said, you're not working with them. Leave them alone. Get, get out the way. And he says, no, I've been working. I went through the apprenticeship program and I've been working for two months just to smile on her face and his face to let his... I know that he actually had a job, right, on a construction job, on a union scale job, and he's in. Today, that gentleman is working in Baltimore somewhere with one of the companies, Spinello, Spinello Company, which is a New Jersey company, but it works around the nation doing uh, sewer replacement. So that's one impact that we see. Also, it gives hope to the community when we looked at uh, small subcontractors, giving them the ability to bid or be a prime or a subcontract on a government job, ushering the progress, make, I mean, the, not progress, ushering the steps and making the progress, the process e easier for them to get in. So we set up to make sure they had MBEs and WMBEs to come to be a part of a project that they would never thought they would have the opportunity to. At one night, uh, working with a construction company in the city of Newark, um, the valve blew off at the meter and it damaged the hot, the hot water tank. We had a contractor that came to one of our community outreach re meetings that was a four-person four -person firm that did cleaning. They were able to come in at eight o'clock at night and clean that basement up, you know, get, clean the water up, um, sanitize the basement, you know, do restoration. And, you know, it was on, this lady had a, $1,500 contract to come in and do restoration and cleanup with a small company, which led her later on to partner Mr. with another company as Mr. a sub. We, we need to, at the time to expire. To get a better company. But Thank you. Great Thank stories. You. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, next, we'll, the gentleman yells back. Next, we'll recognize, the, you two want to go next? Okay, we'll recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Representative Palmer, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for uh, participating and for the subcommittee for holding this hearing. Uh, one of my concerns about uh, what we're doing here is, is asking uh, for funds, uh, additional funds, when we just passed the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, and I guess this would be particularly for you, Mr. Dean. Uh, has the city of, of Newark received funds from, from uh, that bill we just passed yet? No, sir. Um, then why are we asking for more money when we haven't even 
uh, utilize the funds that are you telling me that that we don't have enough money in the in the bill we just passed the 1.2 trillion that's a yes or no no okay uh, what concerns me about this mr. chairman and, and the witnesses is uh, Who's exercising oversight over this? I understand that Mitch Landry, the former mayor of New Orleans, was named by the Biden administration as a coordinator. And I find that interesting considering the condition of infrastructure in New Orleans, particularly their roads, um, and how um, sluggish or even inept they were in New Orleans in handling their infrastructure issues. And I, I just wonder uh, if, if uh, the needs, and there are needs out there for replacing water systems, are going to be met uh, in a timely manner and in, in the most economically, fiscally responsible manner. Uh, uh, Mr. McGough, if, if you'd like, uh, you could respond to that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. What? The question to disperse the funds in a responsible manner? Yeah. So do you have, you? so you agree you have the same concerns about the dispersal of the funds that none of which have been dispersed yet, and oh. that uh, the infrastructure that's been put in place by this administration for, for doing that, I think, raises some questions in my mind about uh, how well this, this will be done and, and how uh, up, um, quickly it will be done, considering that, uh, that we have these needs and we've known about these needs for a long time. And I see uh, Ms. Uh, Matthew nodding in agreement would you like to comment on that yes thank you uh it's it's a good question uh it's a lot of money to move fast and uh, the srf programs uh, have been around for 25 years under this under uh, state oversight um, that program in my state which i have oversight of has a lot of measures and metrics and epa is i will guarantee you is on us constantly about um, a term known as ULO, unliquidated obligations. Uh, they are on us also about pace of the program. And I suspect they'll be adding five or six more metrics on us soon that will tell us how quickly we have to move this money. The pressure to move the money is extensive. Um, the timing of the lead and copper rule, the first phase, was really important to send the signal to our water industry that it's time to get moving to get the lead out. That was an important move. It's figuratively as well as literally. Uh, right, I because we needed that signal because it sends, it sends a message that we're, this is real, now the money is there, we need to move quickly. Um, am I concerned that the money won't, won't move fast enough? Yes. Do we have this, the workforce to be able to move the money? That is a critical need. We need the engineers, the analysts, the financial analysts to be able to do this work. And uh, my colleagues at ASVA across the country are working hard on staffing plans. Um, and again, workforce is, is a concern uh, when it comes to this funding. Uh, but we're up to the task. Yeah. Well, you should also be concerned about the permitting and other issues and, and, and how uh, qualified the people are who are, are acting in a coordination position, particularly in, in respect to the one who is overseeing the entire project. Uh, are and, and getting this done. And, and my big concern is with the inflation rate where it is right now, and we're all talking about the price of a gallon of gas. We keep adding money to the money supply and we'll be talking about the price of a gallon of milk. And uh, so it bothers me that we're having uh, this discussion about needing more money when we haven't spent the money that we have. And the longer you delay, the more costly the project becomes. And like Mr. McKinley, I work for two international engineering companies and I understand a little bit about how long it takes to get things done and how you need to, to move through the, the permitting process, the design, all of that has to be done. And the longer we wait, the more expensive it's gonna get. So Mr. Chairman, it might be that this committee uh, considers exercising some additional oversight in regard to the administration uh, and, and the handling of these funds. With that, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for your indulgence and yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the Representative from the state of Illinois. General lady from Illinois, Representative Schakowsky is recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Chairman. You know, over the last couple of years now, we've been talking about lead 
in drinking water, in schools, um, in the, um, you know, th th throughout the state of Illinois, happens to be number one in the lead surf, surf the, the lead service lines. Um, and um, we are very, very concerned about the effect, particularly on the health of children, the uh, long-term irreversible uh, brain um, consequences that can, that, that can happen. Um, and I know that uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there is um, $15 billion, although I, I do remember when the president was talking about $45 billion, um, and I know that um, maybe yet we'll still get something in, um, in legislation that, uh, that, that passes. And I know that all states uh, are gonna need funding to uh, address this uh, lead service line issue, um, but I am very concerned that Illinois, it seems, is disproportionately not getting the uh, amount of money. I don't know if the um, numbers didn't come through as are having such a, a huge problem. I know that the mayor of the city of Chicago is very concerned. We've had to turn off water faucets in so many of our schools right now because it is, uh, is dangerous. So I, I, I wanted to um, ask uh, Mr. Olson, does the um, current um, uh, uh, state state revolving fund um, consider the uh, the need for lead service line replacements, and is there um, a review of how state individual states are affected that could change the amount of funding that goes to states like Illinois? Um, thank you for the question. It's a very important one. Um, as you mentioned, there's $15 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law that is supposed to be dedicated to replacing these lead pipes. Um, and Congress did pass the American Water, America's Water Infrastructure Act in 2018 that says that each state and EPA are supposed to assess how many lead service lines they have, how much it's gonna to cost to replace. The disconnect is that it's not clear that that assessment is going to be done in time to affect how the money is allocated, at least for the next fiscal year. We're very concerned about that and urge EPA to set that money aside, that $15 billion, and allocate it based on need and get that needs assessment done ASAP. We're hearing it might not be done this year, even though it's supposed to be done this year. So we're hoping EPA will expedite and allocate that money based on need. It's really important for Illinois. It's important for a lot of other states um, that are represented in this room. Um, New York has the same issue. Many other states have this issue. Yeah, we're, we're, we're proud of being number one in some important areas, but not in having the most lead, uh, lead surface lines. Um, I wanted to um, ask Mr. Um, Diaz um, a, a question about your testimony. Um, uh, you you uh, stressed that um, that, that, that we, um, talking about jobs, and um, you, you were talking about um, some of the apprenticeship programs that um, we, um, I th actually pre-apprenticeship programs um, that, uh, that we meet, need. And I'm wondering if you could discuss further how pre-apprenticeship programs could help build the um, trained workforce that we need for our clean water future. Can't hear yeah, you. thank you for that. I'll be apprenticeship programs. Got it. Can you all hear me now? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for the question about how pre apprenticeship programs fit into the uh, greater workforce development needs um, that that we need to replace less service lines. You know, um, you know, speaking with the uh, laborers union in my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, they mentioned that uh, pre-apprenticeship programs, AKA apprenticeship programs and pathways into apprenticeship programs are just so needed to fill the needs of operating engineers, laborers, 
and also uh, plumbers that will be actually replacing these lead service lines. Um, I, I see that I'm over time, so I'll yield for my response. I can definitely follow up with some more information for you, Congresswoman. I'd like to hear that because I think the people that would be most benefited too are those individuals who want good jobs, need good jobs, and need these pre-apprenticeship um, uh, programs. So thank you, I yield back. The general lady yields back. Before we recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes, the uh, ranker has asked to be recognized. Mr. Chairman, during my testimony or questioning, uh, I, I referenced the increased costs that are occurring in infrastructure, uh, particularly copper and PVC water line pipe. I like that, uh, the record that was prepared for the, by the Parkersburg Utility Board on Friday of last week, that that be entered in the record. Okay, all uh, requests to enter materials into the uh, record will be uh, addressed at the end of the, of the hearing, so we, uh, we will take care of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the uh, gentleman from Ohio is now recognized. Mr. Johnson, for five minutes, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, drinking water state revolving funds are a good example of an effective federal state partnership. Uh, and I know these funds have helped finance beneficial projects in all of our districts. This is a good thing. But with the unprecedented huge infusion of cash from the recent infrastructure bill, it's important that we ensure proper oversight on where and for what these funds are now being used. Mr. McGough, I appreciate your mentioning Ohio in your testimony with a great example on how these funds can be used for a wide variety of small and large projects. Looking at the 2022 project priority list in Ohio this year, in my district, the projects range from lead service line replacement in Guernsey County to a water tower replacement in Columbiana County all the way up to a major water treatment plant replacement in Washington County. With projects like these, it's clear this program needs to remain flexible to address the safe drinking water needs of the extremely wide range of communities in rural Appalachian, Eastern and Southeastern Ohio. But at the same time, we do not want to just throw enormous unaccountable amounts of money at these problems without being thoughtful. Mr. McGough, in your testimony, you talked about missed opportunities with the dangers of too much red tape in the form of special categories and one-time only funding streams with the example of lead service lines. So to you, Mr. McGough, when will we know where all the lead service lines are and what will it take in reality to replace all of these lead service lines? It's a very good question, Congressman Johnson, and, and our testimony um, did target the need for assessment. Uh, there are some states that have begun assessment. Um, Newark, for an example of a city that has done a very good job of assessing their, their lead service line, but for the most part, because the SRF programs did not have the funding to direct towards assessment, uh, many states are just getting started with that. So, um, and we think it's very important to assess to make sure that we are targeting the appropriate um, lead service lines to have them removed and to have the flexibility in the funding to do the assessment we think is a necessary first step. Well, uh, obviously replacing these lead service lines is, a, is, is an important thing to do. How important is it to appropriately set public expectations on this? Very important, because it is a process. I mean, you need to identify, assess, uh, and then you need to turn the work into contracts. And um, so there, it will take some time. Uh, the lead service lines uh, will not be removed in two years, three years, five years. It will take some time. And um, appropriately planning, too. Utilities should plan to do the lead service line removal when other projects are taking place uh, like a water main in the middle of the street is the ideal time to replace the lead service line. So proper planning uh, is important uh, to make sure the job is done right. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the difficulty of using subsidized loans, uh, that that may not be ideal for lead service line replacements on private property. 
in your organization uh, concern, is your organization concerned that state uh, SRFs might not be able to use the funding given to them or that they might be tasked with programs where the costs well outweigh the benefits? And, and if, if you agree with that statement, what would be a better way to do it? There is a concern because of the speed in which we need to deploy the funds. Uh, we're sitting here at now 18 months. We need to apply for the funding in the first year, and we have to identify how that funding will be used in order to apply for it. So the, the speed is, is going to be quick, and um, communities, as, as oftentimes the case, would prefer grant funding rather than loan funding. Uh, we in Indiana and many other states have been uh, targeting lead service line replacement with loan funds. Uh, we've been trying to encourage uh, cities and towns to take advantage of that with 0% loans, and we have uh, been making some progress with that. But with the speed at which we are being expected to deploy the funds, uh, the more favorable that funding, the better off or, or the more ability we will be able to meet the timelines afforded us. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes virtually uh, Representative uh, Sarbanes from the uh, state of Maryland. Uh, welcome, sir. And uh, you have five minutes, please. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for today's hearing, and I want to thank you for your ongoing commitment to addressing the issue of drinking water infrastructure. You've made it a priority for, for many years. In fact, you and I had the opportunity on your initiative to visit the Ashburton filtration plant in Baltimore a few years back, and I'm grateful to the leadership that you've, you've exercised in this arena, so I appreciate it. Um, Obviously, this is a topic that affects every American every single day. Uh, when you turn on the tap, you want to know that clean water is coming out, that your family is safe. And that's why these infrastructure investments are so absolutely critical. We know that in communities where residents have a wide disparity of income levels, some residents can be perfectly satisfied with the safety and reliability of their well-maintained water supply while just a few blocks away, their neighbors face a continuous struggle to access clean and safe water, despite being part of the same larger water system. This situation is very prominent, uh, particularly in urban areas such as Baltimore, where low-income residents have for years faced issues like lead contamination. It's a real problem in our city. And the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will help address these problems by providing robust funding uh, to the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, as we've discussed today, which provides these key low interest loans to states for investments in water and sanitation infrastructure. Approximately half, 49% of this amount will be distributed in the form of grants or forgivable loans and will be invested in disadvantaged communities. As you know, uh, these communities which have historically um, borne the brunt of substandard uh, water infrastructure. Mr. Adeem, in communities that have, have stratified income levels um, in a small geographic area, how important is it to ensure that water infrastructure resources like the SRF program are available to the residents who need them most? It's, it's hugely important. Um, we see this time and time again. You just spoke about uh, Baltimore, but we see that these uh, communities, if they're not adequately addressed with their uh, contaminants or funding to remediate a problem, it lasts for generations. You know, by statute, uh, states are allowed to set their own definition for the disadvantaged communities that are eligible for the 49% of the SRF funds. Um, and that offers some opportunity. This control over the definition can provide targeted assistance to areas that, that really need it and the EPA has provided guidance to states to update those definitions for the purposes of allocating these funds. Uh, some states' current definitions of disadvantaged communities would omit urban communities like those I described earlier, where low-income neighborhoods are considered part of larger water systems that also contain more affluent neighborhoods. And so on average, they wouldn't be deemed, they would be deemed not to be in these 
um, in need of this water infrastructure support. So that that's a challenge that we have to address. Ms. Matthew, in order to meet the required distribution of 49% of the SRF allocation going to disadvantaged communities, is it likely that some are going to have to update or redefine which communities qualify as eligible for these funds? Yes, good. Thank you for the question, and it's an important one. Um, I can speak to our state and in, in, in the offices today. We are revising and looking at how we would revise uh, the terminology and um, to help the people that need it the most to to come up with a better definition of disadvantaged communities is important to us. During the time of COVID for the last two years as a health department, many of us have worked on COVID related issues. I myself went out to a number of vaccine clinics and other things and I helped out where I could. But one thing that we found was, was quite interesting is the terminology that's, that the CDC utilizes. It's known as SVI, Social Vulnerability Index. And this index is, is different than the way we have traditionally looked at distressed communities or defined them you know, within the SRF program. So we are looking at the metric, and all metrics, frankly, of in environmental, uh, environmental justice, uh, the EJ definitions, the social vulnerability definitions, our disadvantaged and distressed community definitions, and we're looking to better define where we could help the people that need it the most. So that, that work is ongoing, and from, from what I know, my colleagues in our, in our association of ASWA, is that every state is working on this right now to, better, to have a better definition. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I think this just shines a bright light on how we got to make sure these definitions and other technical dimensions of how the money flows out and is invested are aligned with our intent, the purpose behind the, the infrastructure investment that we've made. I think we can accomplish that. I appreciate your bringing attention to it in today's hearing. Thanks very much. Back. Well, I uh, appreciate that uh, assessment and uh, couldn't agree more. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia. Oh, I'm sorry. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to bring up a point I haven't heard discussed today, and I, I do it carefully because I don't want to imply that there aren't serious needs that need to be addressed, particularly among those who can least afford uh, to pay for it. But as I view the situation during the 20th central century, federal grants and public works programs largely bid out, build out today's water infrastructure. And in my view, this federal subsidization, subsidization and other political choices have led to artificially low water rates and water consumption. Now, Utah's in the state's longest drought, and we're struggling to get people motivated to conserve uh, water. And we talk about water as if it's Free, like it's it's an analogy, right? It's compared to water if it's free. I was a former mayor, mayor and, and dealt with an aging water uh, system in my s s city. And I worry that a lot of our efforts to support cities are well-intentioned, but actually make infrastructure worse in the long run by creating a backwards incentive for cities to wait for federal funding instead of being proactive. Mr. Olson, you referred to a, a decade-old automobile, and it, it made me think about my children if I had given them a car and they didn't change the oil and they didn't do any maintenance on it, would I give them a new car when that car was worn out or would I give them a lecture about maintaining uh, the car? And I, I'm just worried that our cities that we've set up a situation that's actually incentivized bad behavior and, and those who did invest in infrastructure as a, as a city or a municipality or state are, are probably less likely to get help from us now because their, leads, their, their needs are less. Mr. Uh, McGroff, is it possible that too much federal subsidization of local infrastructure has created a city where municipalities, counties, and states have not been building the cost of maintenance into water rates? Um, and and uh, Ms. Matthew, you talked about like how expensive this is, but it becomes less expensive if we look at this over decades and decades of water users contributing to the cost. And Mr. McGroff, would you comment on that? Certainly, thank you, Congressman. Many states, uh, Indiana included, are now in, um, requiring asset management plans be part of the finance um, packages that they receive. 
So recognizing your comments, we want to make sure that uh, we are good stewards of, of federal resources and we now do require utilities and many states are, are starting to adopt the same philosophy that um, utilities uh, do manage their assets appropriately and through the Safe Drinking Water Act, there is the, um, the subject of technical managerial uh, requirements that are associated with managing a utility. And um, we certainly uh, look at those as we are uh, closing financing with those communities. Thank you. Thomas Payne said what we attain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. And I think that applies to water users as well as communities who didn't pay, right, for their, for their systems. Uh, Mr. McGruff, nearly half of the supplemental funding in this program uh, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is directed to principal forgiveness or grants. In contrast to subsidized loans, uh, the traditional instrument of the SRF programs, how big of a change is this and are there any concerns you might have of this becoming a more permanent uh, aspect of the programs? Because the base program uh, is still being funded and the supplemental funding for the base program is continuing, uh, the additional subsidization uh, we are looking at is, is in, an addition, it's in addition to, and it's a five-year window to target those most in need. So um, we don't see this as being a long-term uh, concern. Uh, certainly, um, we are believers in uh, a loan program that recycles loans in and back out to communities. And as long as the base program uh, continues, uh, as we did with ARA, uh, we can adjust and be good stewards of uh, the specialized funding, if you will, to target, uh, in this instance, lead service line and emerging contaminants. Thank you. Let, let me come back to something that was touched on earlier that I want to go back to, and that's this concept of um, homeowners. I, I believe in most circumstances, certainly when I was mayor, the homeowner owns the, the pipes from their home out into the street. And um, are, we, are we giving ad adequate consideration to homeowners who rarely have the funds, right, to, to replace uh, those pipes? And, and what are we overlooking, if anything, here? Or what should we be talking about in the, in the case of homeowners? Who, it doesn't matter if all their pipes are perfect up to their home, if it's led from there up to the, into their taps. And that would be the consideration uh, for having additional subsidization, not just target a disadvantaged uh, community, but if additional funds um, in the lead service line replacement were available for um, additional subsidies or for grant funding, then those homeowners. Uh, we're going to get cut off from the chairman here. I'm seeing him reaching for his mouth. So let me let me just conclude by saying, I think in addition to that, even those that can afford it rarely know that they have the problem or how to do it. And certainly we need to be looking at an educational component as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Brooklyn. We have Representative Yvette Clark. You're um, given five minutes now to ask questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank our ranking member, Mr. McKinley, for convening us today for this important hearing. And let me thank our witnesses for your testimony. Access to clean drinking water is a basic human right. I think this is something that at least most of my colleagues can agree to. And yet, here we are in the year 2022, and we're still, uh, the, the right is still not a reality for too many folks in our nation, particularly when we look at lower income communities, communities of color, and rural communities. This is a major injustice, not only because nobody should have to worry about whether their drinking water is safe, but because we also have the technology to modernize our infrastructure and guarantee clean water for each and every American. If we have the ability to do the right thing, then we also have the responsibility to do the right thing. This is why I was proud to cast my vote in favor of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which makes the largest down payment on clean drinking water in our nation's history. One of the key beneficiaries of these investments will be children. In up to 400,000 schools and childcare facilities who are at risk of exposure to lead service lines. Mr. Olson, can you 
briefly speak towards why lead contamination in drinking water is so acutely dangerous to children and why it's critical that we address this contamination at schools and daycare locations? Thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman. Schools and daycare centers um, are an underrecognized source of lead exposure. Um, it's certainly drinking water is one, also paint is something we should talk about separately. But um, we, we actually looked at the data in New York State, um, which was collected. The, New York ha, is one of the few states that required pretty comprehensive testing in schools. And they found over 80% of the schools statewide had lead levels that, in at least one of their faucets or fountains, that exceeded New York State's then existing action level. Um, so that's a lot of schools, a lot of kids drinking a lot of this water that's lead contaminated, and it can have lifelong impacts. The problem with lead, as we all know, is there's no safe level. And a little bit of lead can cause harm for the child's entire life, learning disabilities, lower ability to earn money, and a lot of irreversible health impacts. Very well, this issue is extremely concerning to me, and that's why my Safe School Drinking Water Act included in the House passed Build Back Better Act would support the installation of filtered water fountains at children's and child care programs across the nation with a focus on underserved school systems. These water stations will take advantage of the latest filtration technology capable of removing lead from drinking water. Mr. Olson, do you agree that this program would be an additional important step in protecting children from contaminated drinking water at schools? This is absolutely a crucial program. It's something that needs additional funding. However, I know the reconciliation bill that this body passed would include additional funding um, that can be applied to that. But it's been a really under-resourced issue and something that we'd really like to see major investment to address in schools. And well, I'll just point out one thing, which is those filters, your approach of filtering, it's much less expensive than ripping out all the plumbing in the school building. And it's more efficient because it'll immediately provide safe drinking water to the kids. So we strongly support that approach. Wonderful, thank you. Lastly, I wanna to turn to the existential threat of climate change. As we've seen in Brooklyn with Hurricane Ida and Superstorm Sandy, one of the major climate impacts we're now having to deal with is more frequent and powerful storms that wreak havoc on our infrastructure. And that's why the infrastructure law established two new EPA programs on water system resilience and sustainability. Mr. Adeem, can you speak to why this federal support is so crucial to cities as they upgrade water infrastructure to deal with the realities of climate change? Thank you, Congressman. Crucial question. Yes, just looking at the last storm, when I was say Hurricane Ida, living in a large urban city that like Newark, uh, one of the oldest cities in the country, um, age infrastructure can't sustain the capacity of these frequent rain events. Uh, seven inches of water over a two hour period. Um, there's nowhere for it to go in large urban um, cities versus a rural area where there's water can receive. Mm -hmm. Ms. Matthew, is there anything you'd like to, uh, to add? Yes, thank you. Um, and excellent point. Um, Storm Sandy taught us a lot in our little state, right? Hit us really pretty hard as well as New York and New Jersey. So one of the things that we've recently started is a, is a, a climate and public health office. We applied for the BRACE grant under CDC, and we're now proud to say in Connecticut that we are a BRACE state, finally. Um, so we want to focus on the people that are harmed the most. We find that uh, again, it's the same people that are harmed um, in disadvantaged communities that have are exposed to heat islands, heat stress, um, and other issues. And we're start we're very pleased to get that work started. But we had to scramble to put the funding together <laughs> to start to focus on climate change and public health because there's a lot of impacts that we're seeing, and we we were we're going to work really very hard on that. Air quality is really very important, and so is water. Well, my time has expired, Ms. I'm Matthew. Sorry. Thank you so much, and I yield back, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Sorry, sir. <clears throat> sorry about that. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Georgia. Representative Carter, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here and for um, indulging in this. Mr. McGough, I want to start with you, and I want to discuss the very small and rural water systems. I'm from Georgia. There are two Georgias. There's Atlanta, and there's everywhere else, and I represent everywhere else. 
So I'm talking about the small towns. Um, a lot of my district in South Georgia is, is small towns. And as we've discussed, all during the water challenges, in fact, I had a, a small town of 300 people just two months ago that inquired about how they could get some funds to drill a well. They, they need help. I've dealt, as I mentioned earlier, um, I was a mayor at one time, and these towns, especially these small towns, they don't have this, this expertise that they need. How, how do you think, Mr. McGough, that states can help assist these communities that have never used the, the SRFs, and how can they use their expertise to assist? Thank you, Congressman. And we do recognize that. I spend uh, quite a bit of my time in small towns personally visiting uh, with the small town officials to try to educate them on our process. Uh, many states have um, professionals, whether it be engineering professionals, finance professionals, and or um, the Alliance for Rural Water, uh, RCAP, some other agencies. Um, many of the SRF programs regularly engage with those professionals as well as the agencies to inform them um, of the resources that we can make available to small communities. And so I think each state uh, has the ability to tailor um, our financial resources to where their needs um, are within those particular states. And from my experience, uh, the, the small communities are being being heard and, and uh, being served uh, in, in uh, multiple ways. Do you think states need more flexibilities um, in order to help these communities? The current flexibility we have works. Uh, it's the unknown. Um, I know that, that the um, substantial guidance that was received from EPA suggests um, uh, paid a lot of attention to disadvantaged community and defining disadvantaged communities. So in the past, uh, the SRF programs, I think, have proven um, their ability to uh, provide funding uh, to get it out the door to the appropriate places. And as long as we can continue to do what we have done in the past, uh, we feel confident that we'll be able to take care of it. Well, let me ask you something. In your testimony, you highlighted how statewide strategies for inventory and lead service lines and testing for, con for contaminants are limited. What, what are other challenges aside from just funding that, that, um, that we need to work on with lead service line replacement projects? Because the lead service line replacement specifically and the emerging contaminants are new for the SRF programs, they are not currently in our or on our fundable ranges or in our project priority list. And in order for us to access funding through EPA, we need to get them on those lists. So that's the, the, the target for those. And in the past or in ERA, uh, for traditional wastewater drinking water projects, we already had fundable lists that included those types of projects. So there will be a bit of a challenge with these new targets, if you will. Um, but the greater flexibility we have um, uh, from EPA to identify those, get them on our project priority list, submit them for funding uh, would be helpful. Let's just say we're, we're successful wildly successful in getting these lead lines um, removed and replaced from with non-lead ones. Is, is that, are we done with the issue or is there more? With respect to the lead issue um, and for the service lines going into the home. I was yes. about to say that, you know, that's still a problem, right? Uh, the removal of lines into the homes, uh, I guess after the premise plumbing, um, we would not be aware of what is actually happening inside the, the premise, but the filters and other things could address those. Problems. Well, we, we can't simply ignore it. I mean, any suggestions? I think through the assessment, we'll come up with some of those suggestions because as we assess, we'll build a knowledge base of what is needed to take care of the problem. And I, so I think as we've, we've testified, the assessment is a very important starting point for us. Okay. Just one last thing. Do you know any other areas that Congress should be watching during the implementation because they may need some statutory corrections? Anything else that you know of that we, we need to be aware of, we might need to be working on with this? Apart from what um, has already been mentioned in my testimony, I think that is, is what we find to be um, of most importance 
especially since time is short for, our, for the SRF programs to make application for this funding. Um, being 18 months uh, is all we have to work with at this point in time. Look, I know it, it's run through the state. I know all too well because, as I mentioned, I was a mayor for eight years, and, and our city quadrupled in size during that eight years. We, we would not have been able to do it had it not been for having water and sewer available. And, and safe water was important. We used the SRF loans, and we depended on the state, and it helped us tremendously. So I hope everyone here realizes, and on the committee, that this is extremely important to these small communities and these growing communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes virtually uh, Representative uh, from California, Representative Barragan. You're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman Tonko, for holding this important hearing on the importance of upgrading America's drinking water infrastructure and how the infrastructure law that President Bondi and Democrats fought will help. Mr. Olson, the investments in the infrastructure law to clean up PFOS are long overdue. In my district, Southgate, a majority Latino community needs funding to remediate water treatment systems to address PFOS contamination. However, for communities with limited resources, accessing federal water infrastructure funds can be difficult because they're often given out through loans from the state revolving funds and must be paid back. How important is it for the EPA and states to focus on steering the infrastructure's law, set aside funding for grants or for forgivable loans to disadvantaged communities? Uh, it's a great question, and it's something that is absolutely crucial, is to make sure that the money that is set aside in the new bipartisan infrastructure law will go to those communities that need it most in the form of either grants or forgivable loans. And the good news is that about half of that state revolving fund money is going to go to those disadvantaged communities through those kinds of provisions. And also there's specific direction for the PFAS money also that needs to go to those um, disadvantaged communities. So I think communities like you're describing really should be able to get that money. The problem is going to be helping them apply for the money, getting them the information, the engineering help, as Mr. McKinley was talking about, to actually pull together a good, strong application. A lot of these communities just don't even have the resources to apply for the money in the first place. So that's gonna be key, is getting the technical assistance from the states and from EPA to those disadvantaged communities to help them apply and get the money. Thank you. Director Adeem, following up on that question, to meet the goals of Justice 40, what additional steps should the EPA and states take to reduce any unnecessary impediments to disadvantaged communities receiving water infrastructure funds and the technical um, assistance needed to pursue them? Good. Excellent question, Congressman. I think the states should be more aggressive in meeting with those disadvantaged and environmental injustice communities and uh, overburdened communities, rural communities, just having dialogue with them to know up front what they're looking for, what their needs, and the resources that the state revolving loan funds can provide. Uh, that technical assistance, that engineering system that sometimes exists, um, but may be limited, but to let those systems know that it's available would be a huge step in moving that Thank you. forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Olson, as you highlight in your testimony, addressing underinvestment in our water infrastructure is only part of the challenge. We also need to strengthen the Safe Water Drinking uh, Water Act and set pollution control standards on water polluters. Why is this so important for clean water and what are the key steps that Congress and the administration can take? Well, thank you for the question. Um, one key issue is that the Safe Drinking Water Act, frankly, is broken. Um, and I'm hoping the committee will spend some time looking into that. Um, it's been a problem for years. The agency is not, EPA has not been able to adopt new standards for things like PFAS that we've known about for years. So that's one issue. Um, in addition, I think a key problem has been that um, with this underinvestment, um, EPA has been reluctant to adopt rigorous standards for some of the contaminants, and I'm hoping that that starts to change. We really need to fix the law and to make sure that we're making the kind of investments that are actually going to make it possible for this to happen. 
Well, thank you. We'll certainly uh, take any suggestions on what we can do to fix it. Uh, Director Adeem, my last question is for you. In new, your, in new work, your city council passed a law to give your department the authority to go into private rental properties without the owner's consent to replace lead services lines. Why was this property as why was this property assessed important to your work in disadvantaged communities and what act actions the EPA and states can take to support rental property access in order to meet the administration's justice 40 goals for the lead service line replacement? Thank you again, Congresswoman, for this most Just important about property access. For this important question. And in the city of Newark, as we may know, the city of Newark is a city of over 315,000 residents. 74% um, of those residents are renters. They don't own their own home. Um, and tenants that lives in those properties, they're always on board of getting their lead service line replaced. But the owners can be a financial institution, um, LLC, that doesn't have an interest in replacing the lead service lines. So part of us reducing exposure to lead we thought the ordinance played a huge role in making our program effective and efficient and save money and time by letting us go by block by block approach and just have anyone give us right of entry to a home to replace lead service line allowed us to replace over 23,000 lead service lines today. So that legislation will be crucial moving forward for any utility that's looking to replace lead service lines. Thank you. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. General Lady yields Mr. back. Chair, back. The, the General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the General Lady from the state of Washington, and uh, also the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Representative Rogers. You're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Ms. Matthew and Mr. McGough, your testimony discusses small rural cities and towns and states that the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators has consistently highlighted because smaller communities can be equally disadvantaged. Why is it important for versatility and flexibility in defining and meeting these small and rural communities' needs? Small, I, as I think it's been stated here before, small communities struggle. A small system can be a system of, say, 41 homes. I recently met with the, the new, um, say, owner. Many of these systems are, are owned or controlled by a homeowners association. They're a group of volunteers that have full-time jobs or maybe two jobs, and they get together on a weekly basis trying to manage a water system. <laughs> so as you can imagine, that is difficult to do. And I recently met with one in the small town of Lebanon, 41 homes, a new, a new person who took on all of this responsibility herself. Um, she's a young mother with four kids, just had COVID, but wanted to meet with us. So we went, we met with her in the town hall with the town first selectman and we talked it through for a couple hours, the needs that she, she has. A lot of it's financial. The rates haven't been raised in years, maybe decades. Full cost pricing, as I think one of the gentlemen was getting at, really is not there for the smaller systems. They haven't raised their rates. So we, in our state two years ago, we passed a law on the, requiring small systems that serve over a thousand, under a thousand people to produce an asset and fiscal management plan. Keep it simple, draft a plan, know what you have, know how old your infrastructure is, know what your rates need to be. She, in this small, small system, has now started to step up the rates. She has worked with her community, she has communicated with her community, and they're all in agreement. It is not easy. Then for her now to take on a loan for the SRF, that's another step. And we're, we're going to work really very hard to get our engineers and our analysts to meet, you know, as, as Mr. Adeen had said, get out in the, into the community and sit down and, and meet with them, Thank talk you. with them directly. It's a really important. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I, I agree. Um, it sounds like we spent the same time in, in these small towns uh, having similar conversations. The beauty of the SRF programs is in their flexibility. Um, each state can tailor their programs to address the needs of their state and um, to meet both uh, urban, large uh, environment or utilities, as well as small towns and small utilities. So I think that is, is the hallmark of the SRF programs is in the flexibility. Okay. 
as a follow-up, your testimony focused on ensuring Infrastructure Improvement and Jobs Act funding is efficient, effective, and streamlined to lower the paperwork burden on the stakeholders. I think that that's a great idea. I noticed that your testimony also calls out challenges and barriers faced by communities, many without expertise, in navigating requirements like Buy America, Build America, and federal prevailing wage requirements. Why do you call out for the development of waivers for these requirements in limited circumstances, and what did your officials learn from the use of waivers to similar requirements in the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act? The, the smaller towns, smaller utilities um, are the least equipped to deal with the uh, um, red tape, if you will. Uh, they need additional resources and or professional assistance. Um, we in Indiana hired uh, labor standard administrators for those utilities to take care of that red tape, and it did come at an expense. Thousands of dollars were spent to um, provide that service for the small communities. So um, it can be done. It just takes additional resources and uh, certainly hand-holding to, to get those communities through the process. Well, and I, I'll let you answer also. I would say the Matthew, same. But I, I would love to hear what are some of the specific challenges to buy America, build America? Because I think we all are, are anxious to see that happen, but what's the reality on the ground? Added cost, affordability of the loan, a small system like the one I just described. So what, can you give me some insights as to what we're facing? I don't have the details, maybe okay. Mr. Un uncertainty, um, we, it, it, it takes states um, some time to get up to speed on new requirements and then educate our borrowers and the Do professionals. Do we have the supplies in America that you would need? The, well, BABA is uncertain. If, if, if okay. it can be implemented along the lines of AIS, then we understand AIS. But if it throws additional requirements to us, that's where the uncertainty is. Okay. Thank you all for being here. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Virginia, Representative McEachin. You're recognized uh, uh, for five minutes, and thank you for joining us virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. The bipartisan infrastructure law will provide approximately $30 billion in investment over the next five years to improve our nation's water infrastructure. Additionally, the Justice 40 initiative should ensure that funds are accessible to small and disadvantaged communities to ease efforts in replacing lead service lines and addressing emerging con contaminants like PFAS. This hearing today is critical. As money begins to flow to states and localities, we must ensure that in the implementation of new funds, that we decrease the pollution burden on low-income Americans and community communities of color because all Americans deserve access to clean water, regardless of race or income. Uh, Mr. Dean, first of all, I want to salute you and the city of Newark for replacing all of your city's 23,000 lead service lines in three years. Particularly, I appreciate that this was done with no cost to residents, as low-income renters are some of the most vulnerable populations. In order to provide lead service line replacement to renters in the city of Newark, uh, your state legislature, I'm sorry, the city asked your state legislature to allow the use of public funds on private property. I know you've spoken of this uh, somewhat in uh, terms of Ms. Baragon's question, but uh, are there other challenges that came with seeking less service lines and replacements on private property that you weren't able to discuss with Ms. Baragon? Yes, uh, thanks. Good question. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, in the city of Newark, it's legislation around uh, you can't use public money on private property, because you may be doing an improvement to a prop to a uh, to the to that property, which would create some type of assessment. Um, in the city of Newark, we've also found out that um, when you start putting the price on replacing lead service lines, it's an opt-in program. Many homeowners um, that own their home or companies that don't that don't live in the city that own the property doesn't participate in removing lead service lines. So having legislation in place that um, you won't provide an assessment on someone that can't afford it anyway um, helps us expedite the replacement efficiently and effectively. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Dean. Mr. Diaz, 
Let me ask you, as you know, the EPA is currently working to propose rules on PFAS public pollution by 2023. What rules would you like to see proposed on PFAS contamination? Thank you for the questions and suggestions are out of my wheelhouse, but I would like to add that, you know, as you know, lead is not the only public health concern and contaminated water exposes communities to harmful chemicals like PFAS and also arsenic. And, you know, more than 27 million Americans get their water from systems that violate health standards. And again, low income communities and communities of color are disproportionately impacted by this contaminated water. The money in the bipartisan infrastructure law is a $10 billion down payment on the cleanup of PFAS and urgent con contaminate, contaminants, but continued investment will be needed as well as further research. Thank you. Thank you. Let me open that question up to Mr. Olson or um, Ms. Uh, Mathayu, if I didn't hurt your name too badly. Um, are there particular rules that you would like to see proposed by EPA uh, concerning P PFAS contamination, either one of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll start briefly. Um, thank you for the question, it's crucial. Um, we'd like to see EPA actually regulate the class of PFAS. They're proposing to just regulate two out of 9,000 PFAS. So we know PFOA and PFOS that are two should be regulated and EPA is moving on that. But we've got, they're sort of like shark's teeth, right? I mean, you've got two of them that we're gonna regulate, but you've got thousands of them literally behind those two that are being regulated. If we don't deal with the whole class, we're never gonna get this problem under control. And what we've seen in state after state, city after city, is that we're not just seeing one or two PFAS, we're seeing whole, a whole lot of different PFAS in a complex toxic mis mixture that people are being exposed to. So we need to crack down on the whole class. And I would add to that, to Mr. Olson's point, I would wholeheartedly agree um, that we're, we're happy to see that EPA is moving in the direction of setting, um, hopefully, maximum contaminant levels for OA and OS. But in our state, we're seeing prevalence of many more. And um, once we start testing, you will find it. And the unfortunate thing is you might find it in school drinking water. Um, because of septic fields and other things. Um, so it, it, I, I would agree that, <laughs> number one, if, if I had, you know, uh, things that we could, we could ask EPA, ask of EPA to continue to move forward with at least OA and OS and move that along as quickly as possible, you know, reviewing all the science and the data, but also help us where we need the help the most with all of these other contaminants. Um, to get a better handle on that is incredibly important as we find them more and more in our state. Thank you so much. I've run out of time and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw, for five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you to the chair. Thank you to the ranking member. And thank you to all the witnesses for coming today on this important hearing. Um, Look, I think uh, even the most limited government conservatives do think that uh, the government has a role in keeping everyday Americans safe and with, uh, with safe drinking water. Um, now, it, and there's communities in my district, for instance, like Tamina, uh, don't have clean water. Uh, my office is dedicated to helping that community get the water that it needs. Um, but along that same theme, there's, there's a key component in keeping uh, drinking water safe, which is chlorine. And last year there was a brief supply disruption in the production of chlorine. It resulted in several communities sporadically losing access to chlorine products and requiring an abundance of boil water notices across the United States. Administrator Regan was so concerned about the communities losing access to chlorine that he actually sent an urgent letter to the chlorine manufacturers, reminding them that chlorine is used in the overwhelming majority of water systems and that they need to prioritize getting those shipments out the door. I'll submit this letter for the record. But that same EPA also advocated so strongly um, against the processes that create chlorine in the first place. Support chlorine, but just not how to make it. Because there's only two ways of making chlorine. One uses asbestos and one uses PFAS. And EPA is working on a draft rule that bans asbestos 
And this committee has worked on a plan, we've passed it out of this Congress, to effectively ban PFAS, or at least create such extreme liability for producing it that many companies will simply choose not to do it. Um, so Mr. Eddy, you've got a water system. Uh, you use chlorine, do you not? And uh, what, what, what do you make of this? What do you make of this? Uh, <laughs> chlorine is, thank you, um, Congressman. Chlorine is crucial to our treatment process um, to provide safe drinking water. Um, disinfect, it's a, uh, disinfectant that's widely used across the country um, to disinfect water. Um, we did see the, last year um, some of the manufacturer having delays in processing and shipping chlorine, especially um, uh, early first quarter of um, 2021 around that. Um, is a <laughs> and, and can you import cheaper chlorine from abroad? I'm, I'm not sure. I, did, I never looked into that. The answer is no. You're not allowed to import chlorine. So you'd have to buy it locally. And if there's, a scarce, if there's scarcity or if it just becomes prohibitively expensive because of the, we crack down on the processes to make it, you know, what do we do? Um, it's a rhetorical question. I don't think you know the answer. The, the, point, the point I'm making is it's a problem. And we cannot regulate in silos. We have to regulate with the entire picture in mind. And I think some of these pursuits have been reckless. They're short-sighted. It's also worth noting that chlorine isn't just a disinfectant for water systems. It's a foundational chemical for fertilizer and medicine as well. And look, it always, it always feels good to ban chemicals that you don't understand. But the question is, will it do any good? No. Fear mongering is often about feelings, not facts. And in this case, it could have serious consequences. Healthcare will be more expensive. Food will be more expensive. Water will be more expensive because that's what happens when you create scarcity via excessive government regulations, increased costs. And so I asked the committee today, with inflation being the number one problem facing everyday Americans, maybe we do away with this short-sighted crusade to effectively ban the very chemicals that we need the most. Uh, I still have some time left. And so, Mr. Olson, you were just talking about uh, the need to crack down on, on PFAS chemicals, but how do we do that without having the second and third order consequences that I just mentioned. And those, those are very real consequences. We talked to the industries that, that make these chemicals that we absolutely need. So how, how, do we, how do we thread the needle? Well, I was speaking to the need to uh, make sure that they're not in the drinking water to filter it out of the drinking water before people drink it. But I think there is a need to go towards reasonable controls on PFAS production. And the vast majority of PFAS um, can be replaced with other compounds. So firefighting foam is one example where it's in widespread use, and now all over the world, um, a lot of airports, for example, are phasing, have phased out PFAS-based um, firefighting foam. So a lot of the big uses, there are alternatives. There may be some crucial, um, absolutely essential uses that need to be re retained until we can find out if there's an alternative. But the basic problem is we're seeing a lot of profligate and I, and I just mentioned one of them. But those companies that, that make the, the PFAS membrane that will create chlorine, they will not do it when they are faced with trillion dollar liabilities because of being regulated under CERCLA. So is well, this the right step to take? Well, I, what I'll say is if you're contaminating somebody's drinking water with PFAS, you ought to be responsible. But they're for not, they're sure making chlorine. And understand, there's, there, there's more to the supply chain than just the, nothing here is touching the drinking water. The PFAS is not contaminating the drinking water in this case. We're talking about how to make chlorine, which is the opposite of contaminating the drinking water. It's what allows you to have clean drinking water. No, I, under, I understand. What I'm referring to is a lot of the actual manufacturing of the PFAS has caused pretty widespread contamination in North Carolina and, and several other states. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. You're welcome. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Dr. Ruiz. Congressman, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and for bringing attention to the important investments we've made in clean drinking water through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Water is life. Access to clean drinking water is a human right and a common good for all. And it is a priority for me for two reasons. First, as a physician and public health expert, I know firsthand how important clean water is for our community's health and for children's development. No matter if a child is growing up in downtown Detroit exposed to lead or in a farm worker trailer park exposed to arsenic in my district in rural California, 
they must have access to safe and clean drinking water. Second, over the last few years, a number of communities in my district have been exposed to water contaminated with dangerous levels of arsenic. I want to be clear, there is no greater environmental injustice than children having to drink contaminated water that can increase their chances of developing neurological illnesses, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. I have been working on this issue since 2019 when the EPA issued an emergency order against Oasis Mobile Home Park located in Thermal on privately owned fee land in the Torres Martinez Tribal Reservation in my district. Since then, the EPA has announced seven additional mobile home parks in my congressional district whose water exceeds the maximum contamination level for arsenic which was naturally occurring in the groundwater in their well water systems. We must do everything to protect the health of my constituents, including getting these farm worker mobile home parks linked up with the local water district so they don't have to rely on these wells pumping unsafe water. Mr. Olson, in your testimony, you mentioned a study that found that socioeconomic status and race were correlated with exposure to contaminants like arsenic and are also correlated with their water system being in non-compliance with safe drinking water standards. What can we do to correct this environmental injustice and how to ensure that these vulnerable communities aren't exposed to these contaminants and are protected by federal standards? It's an absolutely crucial issue, and that's one reason we're really glad that the bipartisan infrastructure law targets at least 49% of this new funding to disadvantaged communities. Now, it's going to be up to your state of California. It's going to be up to each individual state to make sure that money actually goes to the communities that need it. And what we've seen in case after case is, and I just heard earlier this week about a, a situation where state revolving fund money was going to a golf course community to expand a golf course community's um, Drinking water Isn't supply. That, so we we want to target the communities see, that really. See that is need. that is the the reason why we have disparities. That's the reason why farm workers get to, get to drink arsenic in their water. Yet you have development of these of these posh resorts in other areas. And this is a problem in California. Let me let me ask you another question. You know I proudly supported the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, which contained $11.7 billion in funding for the state revolving funds that you just mentioned, which provides loans and other assistance for water projects. This is a fund that could be used for consolidating water systems and help bring clean drinking water to my constituents in these farm worker mobile home parts in the eastern Coachella Valley. However, in the state of California, there's a rule that prohibits utilities from using ratepayer funds for non-ratepayer projects like those in the farm worker trailer parks in eastern Coachella Valley, which prevents the, uh, those mobile home parks or water districts like the Coachella Valley Water District from accessing the federal loan portion of the state revolving funds for water consolidating uh, projects like they can in other states. So with this in mind, how can we help communities under this restriction access the increased money we provided in the infrastructure law for the state revolving fund, particularly for water system consolidation projects? Well, I'd love to talk to your office. I don't know the details of the California rules, which um, surprises me, honestly. I know Community Water Center in California has been working on trying to address some of the very issues you're talking about. Um, and I'd love to follow up with you on that because that's a very important issue. Arsenic should not be in anybody's drinking water. Absolutely at those kinds of not. Levels. You know, we, we just need to put deal eleven point some billion dollars in the state revolving funds. This is a fund pool of pocket that could be used, uh, but we can't bring those funds that we just put money into. So we have to address this barrier in the state of California to to bring the monies into consolidating these projects. And so with that, I uh, yield back my time. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Delaware, Representative Blunt Rochester, recognized for five minutes, and thank you for joining us virtually. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McKinley for calling this hearing. And I also want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony today. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is an important step to provide 
long needed improvements in drinking water quality and accessibility. And we are already seeing the benefits of this legislation in Delaware. Earlier this month, Governor Carney announced that Delaware agencies would start accepting applications for grants and loans for drinking water and wastewater system improvement across the state. Using the historic funding from the infrastructure law to the existing Drinking Water State Revolving Fund and Clean Water State Revolving Fund, along with the recently established State Clean Water Trust to support these opportunities. Water accessibility and affordability in the United States had been a mounting crisis for years, and the infrastructure law gives us an opportunity to make real and lasting improvements across our drinking water systems. But our investments cannot end there. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates that maintaining and upgrading the nation's drinking water and wastewater systems will cost more than $750 billion over the next 20 years. We need to continue to work together to ensure that every person in this country, regardless of race, income, or zip code, has access to clean, reliable, and safe drinking water. This is a fundamental need that we can and should deliver to all Americans. My first question is for Mr. Olson. In your testimony, you highlighted the uh, recommendation to create a low-income water assistance program. And last year, I introduced H.R. 3293, the bipartisan low-income water customer assistance program, along with my colleagues, representatives Catco, Dingle, and Tlaib. Uh, this legislation was in included in uh, previous past packages and would establish programs at EPA that would assist low-income households to maintain access to drinking water and wastewater services. Can you discuss why these types of financial utility assistance programs are so important? Thank you for the question. Yes, um, the, we've actually been supportive of low-income water assistance. We have this for heat. We have low-income heating assistance but we don't have a low-income water assistance program. There, there's a little bit of a pilot program that was created, but it really has not been financed. And it's something that I think is crucial. The other crucial thing to do is make sure that water rates are structured in a way that will help lower-income people. So we favor restructuring of water rates as well so that there may be lifeline rates for very low-income people so that it's a combination of low-income water assistance and reform of water rates. Great. Thank you so much for also mentioning the LIHEAP program. Um, following up on Representative Carter's question, a lot of today's hearing is focused on public water infrastructure, but nearly two in 10 Delawareans use private wells. And some communities in the state are in such remote and rural areas that even if they wanted to connect to a public water system, they are unable to do so. What are states doing to reach more remote communities that are not on public water systems? And how can Congress help support those homes that are not on traditional water lines? Is that a question for Mr. Olson? Yes, Mr. Olson. Okay, um, I'll start. And it looks like uh, Ms. Matthew may also have something to say. But I think it's really important for states to make this a priority. Um, and it's something that I know that for years it's been debated about exactly what has to happen for private wells. Right now, the Safe Drinking Water Act does not protect them at all. And um, it's ending up that so many states are realizing USGS is showing that there's widespread contamination of these private wells and with arsenic, with bacteria, with a variety of PFAS. Um, we really need to address this problem. And currently, the federal laws really don't reach them. And it's been left to states. And, and I'll add to and that. And, yeah. and if I may, uh, I could add to that. In, in Connecticut, there are uh, 325,000 private wells. The only tests that are done is during the first time when that well is drilled. We are trying in Connecticut to pass a law through our legislative session right now to require, at the very least, testing on property transfer, at the very least. Now that's not everything. We really, we really do believe private wells should be tested more often, and there are substantial issues: sodium, chloride, uranium, arsenic, iron, manganese. Um, people face every single day. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of these sources, a lot of these wells do not go on, do not, are not tested at all. We really truly believe that that water should be tested. 
Great, thank you. I have uh, another question that I will uh, set, submit for the record for Mr. Diaz about uh, apprenticeships, um, but I wanna respect everyone's time and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. You're most welcome. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Representative Soto, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a duty in the Congress to provide clean water for every American. My test is pretty simple. If it's not fit for my family, it's not for any, fit for any family in Central Florida. When we see the American Society of Civil Engineers, they've given us a C minus in the most powerful, wealthiest country in the world. When I look at areas in my district, we have in St. Cloud, Florida, resin buildup that has made water brown. We have neighborhoods like Kissimmee where even my neighbor just the other day had a corroded pipe going into our neighborhood that has to be replaced. East Orlando, Kissimmee, Haines City, Winter Haven, Lake Wales, all aging pipes from the 1880s to the early 1920s with some of them built in the 1950s. Add in the septic tanks and other water leaks affect the water quality of our lakes as well and you see there's a big challenge ahead uh, for Central Florida. Uh, I have the fastest growing district in the nation so it's only getting bigger from there but I'm excited that help is on the way. Uh, the infrastructure law, $55 billion for drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. $30 billion for drinking water, helping the state revolving funds that have been talked about so much here. $9 billion to remove PFAS, $15 billion for lead. We appreciate uh, two of our Republican colleagues on this committee for supporting the bill as well as all Democrats. Uh, we need to move forward on this. Mr. Deem, it'd be great for you to help us paint a picture for my constituents. Uh, for pipes that were built from the 1880s to the 1920s that are 100 to 120 years old, what do those look like right now and how does that affect water quality? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. They, they, they're, they're old, they're brittle. Um, the C factor is uh, tuberculation buildup on old cast iron water mains or, you know, in my city we removed uh, in, in the early 1900s, we took out one of the last 1990s, we took out one of the last wooden water mains. Um, it was great to see. Um, but this infrastructure has exceeded its lifetime. Um, we have pipes dating back to Abe Lincoln, was President Lincoln was in, in power when uh, was the president when we uh, had our distribution system. It's time to upgrade those systems. And we thank you for that. mentioning the, the old cast iron pipes because that's exactly what flooded in our neighborhood next to a constituent's daughter's bedroom. Uh, as it was bringing water in for the neighborhood and for fire hydrants. Uh, Ms. Matthew, it'd be great for you to also paint a picture of what 100 to 120 year old pipes look like and then add in that some of them were made from lead. How does that affect communities? So we, we have a lot of those aged mains in our state, a lot in the Northeast. Um, all of those need to be replaced over the next 10 years. We also have wooden water mains that <laughs> are being replaced in our state. Um, they are, um, the unfortunate thing is that there's so many of them to replace. And many, in our state, we have many, we have about 40 medium-sized cities. And many of those struggle financially. They're between 40 to 50,000 people. They're also dealing with stormwater sewer water, CSOs, you know, disconnecting the storm water and the sewer water, as well as drinking water. This infrastructure funding, this influx to drinking water infrastructure is, inc is, is timely, is incredibly important to working with those communities, those, those 40 communities that serve larger populations, that have populations within them that are disadvantaged, that need the help, that need the investment, in their, not only their pipes, but their treatment, their pump stations, and all the other mechanisms that run that system. I'm glad you mentioned mid-sized cities. I have a lot of them that are around 50,000 people, like a St. Cloud or a Kissimmee or a Winter Haven, Florida. Uh, you mentioned them in Connecticut, too. What would it cost to do a basic upgrade of, uh, of aging pipes and water systems in a mid-sized city of 50,000? If you want to defer to Mr. Adeem, by all means. Thanks, Congressman. It would, 
normally depend on the length of water main or sewer main that they have, this, this length and the size, but it's millions of dollars, probably billions of dollars. Well, thank you for that. When I think about wooden pipes and uh, cast iron pipes that are, uh, we don't have wooden ones in Central Florida, we're a little newer than that, but we have cast iron pipes that are corroded that uh, when they dug out of the ground, you can't believe that drinking water for our families in modern times, we're going through such an antiquated um, piece of piping. So thanks for your testimony today. Together we can get this done for America, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Mr. Holleran, you're recognized for five minutes, please, and thanks for joining us virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member for this, uh, uh, ensuring that every American has access to clean drinking water hearing. What a novel idea. Uh, this is a critical issue across America, but even more so in northern Arizona, where tribal lands and rural lands have continued to be left behind. I often talk about the digital divide, but there is also a drinking water divide in our country. In my district, 40% of homes on the Navajo Nation do not have access to clean drinking water. This problem is compounded by the historic injustices of environmental uh, degradation on tribal lands and the government's failure to clean up the over 500 abandoned uranium mines on, a, on the reservation. These Superfund sites directly limit the availability of clean drinking water for thousands of Navajo residents and put at risk huge aquifers in the, in the Western United States. For far too long, the government has stood in the way of the tribe's ability to protect our citizens from harmful contaminants. Mr. Olson, Tribal communities face unique challenges. How can we support tribal communities so they can access clean drinking water? What resources in the bipartisan infrastructure law can be used towards that, that goal? And beyond funding from the, law, from the law, what else can Congress do to help these communities access safe drinking water? Thank you for that really crucial question. I mentioned in my testimony how tribal communities in so many cases have in some cases, no drinking water at all, no sanitation at all. They, don't, they have to carry their water. In a lot of other cases, they have contaminated water. Um, a key is certainly funding. Um, another key is technical assistance because a lot of these communities, they don't have the wherewithal to even put together an application to get the money. So we, we need to have money that's specifically set aside for the tribes is one key aspect. And then we also need the technical assistance to help them actually apply for the funds and to actually implement and to operate and maintain these, these facilities. And I would agree with you what's gone on in the Navajo Nation with uranium mining contaminating um, large swaths of the tribal areas is inexcusable and the federal government really owes a lot to that community to clean it up. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The uh, bipartisan infrastructure law makes historic investments to the United States drinking water infrastructure, including $9 billion to remove PFAS contaminants from drinking water, a serious issue facing in the Tucson water system. The law also includes $30 billion uh, for water infrastructure, and this funding is badly needed uh, throughout the Western United States and, uh, and America. Last week, my staff visited a small town in my district, Kearney, and saw the decaying water infrastructure firsthand. The residents there can't drink the water. Cleanup and, and, and replacement of drinking water infrastructure is often prohibitively expensive, uh, making it unrealistic that small towns like Kearney uh, can foot the bill. It's a, it's a historic mining area also. Uh, Ms. Mythow, um, you, you mentioned in your testimony uh, the challenges towns and communities with very small populations have with applying for funds through the drinking state revolving funds. Uh, how can states, tribes, and the EPA work to ensure these small communities are able to upgrade their drinking water infrastructure? What does a successful partnership look like in implementation of these funds? And how can we work with the states, especially, to make sure that their laws are in compliance with the intent of Congress? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. The smallest systems struggle the most. They struggle with compliance of the Safe Drinking Water Act, just the most basic things. 
and I, I think a number of uh, panelists have said it, they need technical, direct technical assistance. Um, and that may not be my engineers who are regulators. That may be the rural water associations, the circuit riders, this technical hub. And, and not just one time and hold a night meeting and leave, but to stay there. You know, I, I've talked to many people who look at us as, you know, we're the bad guys, we're the regulators. But you have to meet them in their neighborhoods, you have to talk to the people, and you have to understand what their concerns are. And again, a lot of it's financial. They do need technical help in just completing the applications. And I think Mr. Adin also said. Ms. Matthews, no, I, I do have limited time, and I, I do want to I'm just sorry. say, Chairman, we, we have to find a way to make sure the states address the intent of what we're trying to accomplish here for rural America and tribal lands in America, and not just concentrate on these other areas that already have good drinking water, and they're just trying to improve it a little bit more versus what we see day in and day out in many areas of our, our rural America. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Quite well made, gentlemen yields back, and uh, the chair now recognizes virtually uh, the representative from the state of Florida. General Lady, uh, Representative Castor is recognized for five minutes, please. Hi, Chair Tonko, uh, and thank you to our panelists very much for uh, discussing clean drinking water today. I mean, clean drinking water is central to the health and prosperity of families across the country, uh, making sure that they can thrive. And the bipartisan infrastructure law is an enormous achievement for President Biden uh, and all of us, but most importantly, it will help our communities back home. So, Chair Tonko, this oversight hearing is very important. I appreciate you you organizing it, uh, especially in the wake of the fact that that we know we have aging pipes. Uh, it's not lost on us that the American uh, Society of Civil Engineers had graded uh, drinking water infrastructure with a C. It's worse in a lot of areas due to aging infrastructure. In my neck of the woods in the Tampa Bay area, we consistently have water main breaks and uh, having to replace uh, service lines. And now we we know we also have a moral responsibility uh, to get the lead out of uh, those the piping, to replace the lead pipes and address uh, the PFAS for ever, ever chemicals. But we also need to uh, make sure that these substantial funds, as they are distributed across the country, that they go to make communities more resilient, that our drinking water infrastructure is resilient to the rising costs and impacts of the climate crisis. And Mr. Diaz, in your testimony, uh, you noted the importance of EPA's implementation uh, guidance for ensuring equity and climate resilience. Uh, EPA has said that states should prioritize disadvantaged communities and support projects that apply the best available and most geographically relevant climate information, uh, projections, and standards such as the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Uh, communities across the country are already experiencing those climate-fueled uh, rising costs and impacts, whether it's sea level rise or more frequent and costly storms. So how how can Congress help states and communities access information about climate risk and vulnerability to ensure that the projects will be resilient into the future to make sure that they're making cost effective decisions? And how can states prioritize the needs of environmental justice communities in state plans and funding allocations? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman Castor. Um, you know, climate change has a great strain on our nation's water infrastructure and the drinking water and clean state, the clean drinking water um, state revolving loan funds are the main sources of funding for states, not only to update and maintain water infrastructure, but also to ensure that this infrastructure is resilient to climate change. Uh, one study from the National Association of Clean Water Agencies estimated that states will need an additional 448 to $944 billion by 2050 to re-engineer water systems to cope with sea level rise, extreme weather events, droughts, and floods. 
Uh, the EPA estimates that just the capital cost of clean and drinking water infrastructure over the next 20 years is about $750 billion. Uh, we have received a historic infusion of funding in the bill and somewhere in the ballpark of about $23.5 billion for drinking water and clean water state revolving loan funds. And that's split equitably. Um, this, this is a massive step and provides a significant down payment on the investment needed to upgrade our water systems. Well, and thank you very much. And Mr. Olson, you've testified about the importance of addressing climate risk to water infrastructure, including extreme weather and droughts and groundwater depletion, saltwater intrusion. Uh, you recommend increasing the use of integrated water resource uh, management strategies to help with water supply and flooding and water quality in a more integrated way. How can Congress help uh, promote that that uh, thoughtful strategy on integrated water resource management? Well, it, obviously funding is part of it um, and is urgently needed. And unfortunately, there we're going to be facing, I think, a, a nationwide crisis as we see more and more of these extreme storms and more of the drought conditions we're seeing in many parts of the country. Um, so I think funding is part of it. Assistance in identifying where the problems are worst. Um, we're seeing a lot of coastal areas like your district um, where you're seeing saltwater intrusion becoming a significant issue in many of these coastal areas. And as climate change happens, we're gonna see more of that. Um, so I think help with planning and technical assistance with planning and dealing with that are, are going to be key aspects of it. But without the funding, you're not going to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, you're most welcome. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California who joins us virtually. Representative McNerney, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Well, I thank the chairman. I thank the witnesses for hanging in there. Uh, I may be the last wit the, the last uh, a member, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very proud of the historic investments that we've made with the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to improve the drink drinking water uh, and health uh, of our systems. However, the American West is in the midst of a mega drought, at least 112 years, uh, the worst in 112 years, 2022, in fact, has seen the driest January and February on record. Farmers are facing severe water cuts. Wells are drying up. Some communities have already run out of water. So uh, we have to uh, achieve long-term drought resilience, which requires long-term dedicated investments. If you don't have water, you don't have to worry about water quality. So uh, our water system lose, systems lose about 14 to 18% of treated water and leaks in the system an additional amount is lost through inefficient fixtures. Uh, Mr. Diaz, you spoke of the energy and financial implications of wasted water in your written testimony. Would you elaborate on the benefits of improving water efficiency and addressing water loss? Uh, certainly, Congressman. Um, you know, the question is, is spending all this money to replace our water infrastructure truly fiscally responsible? And, you know, in terms of less service line replacement, you know, investing in less service line replacement not only prevents lead poisoning and creates jobs, but also saves taxpayers money in the long run. In terms of wasted water and, you know, what the bipartisan infrastructure law investments do to help us preserve uh, water main I'm sorry, water systems through preventing water main breaks and leaks. Um, it, it is an investment that, it, that is truly needed. Um, I do not have an adequate response to your question in detail, but I would like to follow up with your office to provide some more insight. Very good. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Olson, would regular audits and improved data collection help reduce loss in drinking water systems? Yes, um, we certainly believe that one key is to have water loss accounting so that um, the water systems are actually tracking. I actually um, looked into one system, a large system in Puerto Rico that said that they were losing 50% of the water that they pumped into their um, system um, is unaccounted for. So uh, what we're seeing is pretty widespread problems. That's an extreme example, but we heard earlier um, just today in this hearing that as much as 30% of, of water is being wasted or lost. And that's just an unsustainable situation. We need to 
tighten up those pipes, replace the old pipes. We've heard about 100 plus year old pipes. They need to be replaced and uh, tightened up and we'll actually save money over the long term if we do that. Well, given the water energy nexus, I mean, uh, losing one and wasting one is wasting the other as well. So uh, very important in terms of uh, water availability and climate change. Um, Ms. Matthew, a 2014 GAO review found that 40 out of 50 state water managers expected shortages in the next decade and that additional uncertainty is likely with climate change. What additional resources do drinking water administrators need to plan for, uh, need to plan uh, for, secure, for scarcities and shortages, especially in the drought prone areas? I, I think what's, what's mission critical for public water systems uh, to have plans to have long-term plans, to test their sources of supply and understand what their safe daily yields are. And then to, not to do that once 30 years ago, but to do that maybe every couple of years so that you understand the impacts of climate change. I, I think a lot of the impacts are not understood or, no, or known. And I think many utilities maybe across the country uh, need to do more planning and invest in that planning. Okay, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Olson, uh, in California's Central Valley, where my district is located, nitrate pollution is becoming increasingly common in groundwater. Many communities have lost their wells to nitrate pollution and are now relying on water deliveries. What kind of strategies are needed to address and mitigate uh, legacy pollution in source water and groundwater? Well, there are basically two things that need to happen. One is we need to control the sources of nitrate pollution, which we're not doing a very good job of in so many communities. Over application of fertilizer or sewage um, can be contributors. And we also, frankly, need to invest in fixing the nitrate problem where there's a legacy contamination. Um, that means pretty expensive treatment. Um, some utilities like Des Moines, Iowa, have had to spend tens of millions of dollars to clean up their nitrate contamination. and some, some smaller communities especially are gonna need help um, in paying for treatment because it's not cheap. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, my time's up, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna yield back to you. Thank you. The uh, gentleman yields back, and I believe that completes the list of members that have chosen to uh, ask questions of our witnesses. Uh, I do, on behalf of the uh, subcommittee, thank all of our witnesses for joining us for today's hearing. Uh, tremendous information exchange, and uh, thank you for uh, the challenges you're, you're making our way to uh, make certain that uh, we move forward with greatest progress. I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days by which to submit additional questions for the record that uh, would be answered by our witnesses. I ask that our witnesses please respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. Uh, before we adjourn, I have... Uh, uh, there are a list of, of uh, items that have been requested uh, for unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. A letter from the National Rural Water Association, a letter from the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, a letter from the American Water Works Association, a letter from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, a letter from industry associations, a replacement ordinance notice, a letter from the Department of Environmental Protection of the State of New Jersey, inventory source data from the um, uh, Parkinsburg Utility Board of West Virginia, and a letter from EPA Administrator Michael Reagan, without objection, so ordered. With that, at this time, the subcommittee hearing is adjourned.